we've got a pretty packed, we've got a pretty packed agenda today, <clears throat> which um, uh, I we extended the meeting to one o'clock today. I know that we uh, have now burned half hour of that, and so um, I'll try to keep us on target to stay within our allotted time. But uh, really appreciate everyone participating today. Um, quick overview of the agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about our tour policy. We've got one written public comment um, that was provided. We didn't have anyone sign up for um, oral public comment today. Um, that written public comment has been distributed to everyone <clears throat> via email. Um, and so uh, acknowledge the receipt of that written public comment. Um, we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit about our May 1st deliverable. And then we've got some uh some presentations from different members of our uh consortium including clay terry who's going to give us a presentation on produced water management projects and oil field produced water treatment recycle and reuse we've got dr cloel danforth giving us a presentation on a method to identify and prioritize produced water chemicals for research uh, and finally we've got dr james rosenblum who's going to give us a presentation on water quality of produced water um, uh, in addition, we've got executive director of Department of Natural Resources, Dan Gibbs, is going to stop in and uh, chat with us uh, about the first deliverable and um, the work that we're doing with the consortium. And so when he has an opportunity to jump in, which should be around 11 o'clock, um, we'll give him some time to share his thoughts with us. And so really appreciate him being willing uh, to engage with us in the meeting today. Um, I do want to congratulate us on our first deliverable, which has been accomplished. It's been delivered um, and uh, appreciate all the work of everyone on the consortium and those others in both ECMC and DNR that worked hard to accomplish that deliverable. And so well done all uh, to take our first step forward. Um, I also want to take a second to welcome John Lipka, who's our new consortium member as a represent, uh, representing the Raton Basin. Uh, John, if you're on the call here this morning, would you take a second and just introduce yourself to us? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, uh, the, yes, I'm the uh, asset manager and the opera, director of operations down here for Evergreen Natural Resources in Los Animas County. Uh, and I look forward to working with you all. Uh, we, we, uh, as you know, the Raton Basin is coal bed methane. Um, so the handling and, um, uh, and the responsibility associated with produced water is critical to our operation. So uh, um, it's a real pleasure to meet you all, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to serve on the consortium with us. I promise that we are not often late at our meetings. We're usually right on time. And so uh, uh, this was just an anomaly here this morning. Um, I also want to announce that we have hired uh, Assistant Director for Research, Dr. Erin Sidlaco. Um, she is not here today. She's at a conference. And so I don't want to give uh, her introduction. I would like her to have that opportunity to do that. And so she's going to take some time at the next meeting to introduce herself, and, um, but excited to have her on board um, as the Assistant Director for Research for the Consortium. <clears throat> we do need to go through and formally uh, announce our presence, each of us individually, just to develop the record. And so we'll go through that process here quick. If you could just state your name and the seat you hold on the consortium, uh, I'm gonna go through uh, and identify your names based on what I see on the screen right now. And so if we could start with Michael Freeman. Um, hi everybody, uh, Mike Freeman, Environmental NGO. Sean Strody. Sean Strody, uh, elected official for Western Colorado. Jeff Kirtland. Good morning, Jeff Kirtland, industry representative with the Peons Basin. Uh, Irene Andrus. Good morning, Irene Andrus, environmental justice. Chloelle Danforth. Hi, Chloelle Danforth, a nonprofit. Hope Dalton. You usually call me last, so. <laughs> 
I, this Pope is Dalton. where you're not on my screen, so. <laughs> Pope Dalton, director of the Colorado Produced Water Consortium. Eric Anglin. Yes, good morning, Eric Anglin, um, in the engineering expertise and experience position. Trisha Pfeiffer. Good morning, Trisha Pfeiffer, US EPA Region 8, federal position. Jolie Bronner. Good morning, thank you. Jolie Bronner, member of a non-governmental organization in the state that works on and advocates for policies related to environmental justice and conservation. Kevin Chan. Kevin Chan, representing people of color and disproportionately impacted neighborhoods. Clay Terry. Uh, Clay Terry, Natural Resource Advisors, uh, a uh, um, industry uh, expertise in handling produced water. Emma Pinter. Emma Pinter, uh, Adams County Commissioner, Local Government. Uh, we've already heard from John Lipka, so Ember Michelle. <clears throat> Uh, representing disproportionate impacted communities. Randy Honeycutt. Randy with the Colorado Department of Environmental Public Health and Environment in the Water Quality Control Division representing the state. Michalina Pollack. Good morning, Michalina Pollack, San Juan Basin Industry Representative. Uh, Joseph Ryan. Hi, right, Joe Ryan, University of Colorado Boulder, academic representative. Barbara Vasquez. Barbara Vasquez, representing um, conservation, grassroots organization, and NGO. Tessa Sorensen. Tessa Sorensen, uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment Administration Division and governing body member. Harmony Cummings. Harmony Cummings, environmental NGO. Uh, Nikki Wells. Nikki Wells representing disproportionate impacted communities. John Heil. Morning, John Heil with the ECMC representing the state. Thank you. Uh, James Rosenblum. Uh, James Rosenblum representing one of the academic seats. Tracy Kozloff. Tracy Kozloff, State Engineer's Office and Governing Body. Uh, Mark Hefta. Hey, thanks, Mark Hefta, uh, representing the DJ Basin for the industry. Great. And I also acknowledge we have uh, Assistant Director Aaron Ray with us here today, as well as uh, Assistant Attorney General Kyle Davenport. Um, so with that, uh, let me find my agenda here. We'll go on to announcements and housekeeping from Director Dalton. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Metzner. And I wanted to acknowledge the chat. Jolie Bronner wanted to share today is International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to everyone. So I, I share Chair Metzner's uh, congratulations to everyone and encourage you to have jazz hands or claps for delivering our first deliverable. That was a big accomplishment. Everyone had about two weeks to get it finalized and you everyone did a fabulous job. Uh, what have I been up to? If you're following me on LinkedIn, you might see that I have gone to the Groundwater, uh, Groundwater Protection Council's UIC conference in Oklahoma City. And I was at the Water and Energy Conference in Midland, Texas this past, um, well, earlier this week. And I was interviewed by a local channel, CBS 7. I can send that out to you. But the theme was that Collaboration is the key to innovation, and this embodies what the consortium is doing, having so many different voices at the table. So this renewed my passion for the consortium and the work that we do. 
I'll be working this month on the FY2526 budget, and we have an annual report due to the House Energy and Environment Committee and the Senate Transportation and Energy Committee. It's just an annual report in the future. Our annual reports are going to be January to December. It'll be on the calendar year, but this is just um, from when we started in July to now and just a compilation of what we've accomplished. <clears throat> uh, I see in the comments, Barbara Vac Vasquez will be at the Water Reuse Symposium next week. Stop by. I'll be presenting along with New Mexico and Texas on Tuesday at the Water Reuse Symposium. I did, uh, Chair Master, want to remind everyone of our remaining deliverables. I think it would be valuable to our conversation when we do start talking about deliverable two. Is that okay? Do we? Okay. Seeing yes, I will. So we've completed, we have nine legislative deliverables and this year is operational. It's fast and furious. Um, it's okay. Years two, three, four, and five will be full of lots of fun as we're just building the house right now. So we got our first one done, the best practices report, hooray. Uh, today, we'll be looking at, at the draft for our second deliverable, which is regulatory coordination. And the reason I'm going to go through the rest of them is because some of the comments, I feel like everybody is trying to solve everything at once. And so some of the comments we might ask to delay to a future deliverable. Our third one will be to identify current infrastructure. And our fourth one is to identify the availability of produced water for reuse and recycling. For our fifth deliverable, we're kind of revisiting our third deliverable on infrastructure. So we'll have the current infrastructure. Our fifth one is about what is needed to fully promote the reuse of produced water in oil and gas activities. And this is just a reminder, our goal is to reduce the use of fresh water uh, in oil and gas activities and consequently increase the use of produced water. Our sixth one is to develop priority topics. And then, you know, really it's the meat that all of you really are here for. In November, we'll be recommending legislation and rules to remove barriers to the use of produced water. In December, we'll be recommending short and long-term goals. And then our final deliverable is in 2025 and is related to analytical and toxicological methods, which we're building our uh, consortium knowledge today on. Um, as a reminder, state your name when you're speaking for those who are unable to see the video and raise your hand to speak. Thank you, Chair Messner. Uh, thank you, Director Dalton. Uh, good reminders to us all about the different deliverables we have coming up and um, appreciate that you're out there talking about the consortium um, in um, a number of other states and uh, forums. So appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, I did wanna just take a second here um, and give, uh, Eric Anglin a chance to talk quick about, uh, I think what I think is a really exciting project that was recently approved by ECMC um, around reuse and recycling um, on site um, within the DJ basin. So I don't know, Eric, if you'd be willing to just give us a quick update on that project and um, kind of what your concept was there, but it was, a, um, it was exciting for me to hear about it during the permitting process. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Messner. This is Eric Anglin with Occidental Petroleum. Um, appreciate the commission's support on the project that was presented earlier this week to the ECMC. Uh, just to highlight quickly for the team, this project is part of a larger comprehensive area plan. Uh, it's a project we've been working on for several years. It's a uh, consolidated project on a large ranch in uh, northeastern Weld County. Uh, it's fairly 
remote, but also consolidated, which gives us an opportunity to apply several best practices in that area, including recycle. And um, with the operations and the planning that we've come up with, we intend to be able to recycle all the produced water that's generated on that ranch uh, during our completion operations. We'll be able to avoid trucking any of that water off to disposal, um, making best beneficial use of the resources out there. Great. Thanks for the update on that. Um, it was exciting Thank to you. see that level of recycling happening in the DJ Basin, which is relatively unusual. Uh, and so great to see that project uh, um, at least conceptually get off the ground. And so um, uh, next item on our agenda, a oh, uh, hand up by Tracy Cosma. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, when you say recycling, do you just mean that just on site for the oil and gas operations, you're going to be using the water? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And that reminds me of something I've heard of say about our terminology. We don't always use the same words and or know what they mean. So thank you for that clarification. No, you're right. And that's actually... Um, something that I think we should discuss at some point is, you know, the what we mean when we say recycling, what we mean when we say reuse. And, um, you know, I think Commissioner Pinter had brought this up as well. And so um, that's something I think as far as clarifying our terminology would be, would be good to discuss, you know, as we start working through some of these deliverables. Um, so anyway, moving forward, next uh, item on the agenda is just a, a, a quick update on the tour policy. And so um, just for folks to know, um, so certainly are, are interested in trying to coordinate some tours, educational tours for the consortium. Um, so any tours considered for the consortium need to be education-based and inclusive of all the consortium members. That doesn't mean that all the consortium members necessarily have to go at once, because depending on what the situation is, we may have to go in, in different um, waves uh, or days, depending on what tours we may be engaging in, um, but it should be open and available to all the consortium members. Uh, and it needs to be coordinated through the director. Um, during any of the educational tours, uh, there should not be any deliberation or discussion of policies, recommendations, or business consortium. So again, education-based only uh, for our knowledge. Um, and if you do have any suggestion for tours, um, I do encourage you to reach out and contact the director for the coordination of those ideas and see what we can do to get them on the schedule. So um, any questions about that? John, uh, this is Sean Shorty. Yep. Um, are, are individual tours okay? I've I've talked to some people um, in my region that have offered tours. I, I haven't been able to take them up on that yet, but um, that would be more of an individual basis. Is that something that is best to open it up to the consortium then, or is it okay to do it individually? Uh, AG Davenport, thoughts on that? Sorry about that. I um, didn't quite hear the full question. Whoever asked to repeat it. Um, so I've been uh, in 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 talking uh, with my region. Some people have offered to do individual tours for me, just to let me know what's going on in the produced water area. Um, as, as a consortium member, am I allowed to do those individually, or would that need to be opened up to the entire consortium? If, if a single member of the consortium goes on a tour, that um, nothing needs to be done in regards to open meetings law. Um, you can go on that tour. You don't have to notice it or, or um, alert anyone to put it on the website that you're going on the tour. If two or more consortium members go on the tour, I want to talk about exactly what was going to happen on the tour and how it was going to work, but um, one consortium member is fine. Perfect. Thank you. Good question. Um, okay. Any other questions? All right. So moving on, um, as I had indicated, 
we did have written public comment. I thought it was really thoughtful public comment. Uh, and it was from Christine Mize Spansky from Keras. And so I encourage everyone to take a second and read that public comment. Um, it is in everyone's inbox. And if there's no other comments, um, I think we'll move on to the review of the May 1st, 2024 deliverable and discuss recommendations for regulatory coordination deliverable. Um, and I'll kick this off. So, so again, the process that we're gonna attempt to go through as we start to work through some of these deliverables is to you know, have an initial discussion for direction on you know, what staff should be working on in developing drafts um, of certain deliverables. A draft will get developed and then there'll be an opportunity for different online comments um, to be able to be provided to that draft. And then that draft will be presented again at the next meeting for discussion amongst consortium members um, and additional suggestions for modifications or adjustments associated with that deliverable draft. Um, and then, um, and then again, it goes, you know, off to the director's office where they'll continue to work on and modify um, with the different comments that were provided at the meeting and any additional comments provided by consortium members between meetings. And then uh, a final draft would be presented to the consortium um, for um, approval um, and insurance that all of the voices of the consortium were included uh, in that <clears throat> draft before we finalize it. Um, and move it forward in the process. And so right now we're at the very early stages. We've given the uh, director direction as far as what needed to be considered in a draft. That draft has been developed. There's been a, a lot of different consortium members that have been engaging in comments associated with that draft between meetings. And so here we are today um, and we'll develop a, um, well, we'll have a discussion on that draft. Um, so in this particular uh, deliverable, the deliverable is how state and federal agencies can better coordinate regulatory policies related to produced water. <clears throat> and I think the emphasis here is on, on the coordination. And so we're not rewriting all of the policies of every agency that we're talking about here today. Um, we're talking about how the different agencies can better coordinate their regulatory policies <clears throat> um, related to produced water. Um, we've started this conversation with some uh, kind of current state presentations from the different regulatory agencies to give uh, the different consortium members an idea of what uh, regulatory policies are in place within the different agencies. Um, and you know, this deliverable really came from discussions that happened prior to um, the formal development of the Produce Water Consortium, where we had uh, different stakeholders providing feedback that there was not a clear path that if someone was looking to propose a reuse or recycling project, um, what, the, what the regulatory path was in order to be able to get a regulatory approval of a project. And so there was some confusion or um, sometimes there was gray areas as to who was regulating what. Sometimes there was confusion as to um, which agency <clears throat> a person needed to engage with in order to get different permits. <clears throat> and then there was even some discussion at that time that there was perhaps conflicting regulatory policies between agencies. Um, and so this was really an opportunity to look at that and see if there was opportunities to have agencies better coordinate with one another. <clears throat> Apologize. Um, and, and, and try to create a, a clear regulatory pathway for um, reuse and recycling of produced water, um, either in field or outside of the oil field. Um, and so that was really, that was really the goal. Um, and so um, as I looked at, and this is my personal comment. So as I looked at the draft and I look at the different comments, I really appreciate the work and the, and the comments that were provided in there. I did note that some of the some of the 
information that was provided in the draft, um, as well as some of the comments that were initially included in that may have um, created a little bit of mission creep. Um, and so maybe we're looking a little more at things that we may look at in some of the future deliverables versus kind of, I think the core intent of this particular deliverable, which was that coordination of um, regulatory policies or, or a clear regulatory pathway for um, understanding what needed to happen if to implement different reuse or recycling projects in the state of Colorado. Um, but I, I appreciate the effort and the comments and certainly interested in hearing different folks' thoughts on that. And, uh, um, but I wanna start the conversation here today by giving each of the regulatory agencies an opportunity to initially comment um, both on whether the draft captures kind of current state in the regulatory process um, and any thoughts that they have as far as um, how they see opportunities for better coordination of regulatory policies agency to agency. And so um, I think we gave everyone a heads up that this was coming at the regulatory agencies. And so um, I'm just gonna randomly pick one of you to start. So maybe whoever's first on my screen. Uh, Trish Pfeiffer, you are first on my screen. I'm first, yay. <laughs> yeah, so for EPA, the main water statutes that we implement our authority under is the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. I talked about these um, two programs, the Underground Injection Control Program and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Systems Program, so UIC and NIPTES. And for those two programs, EPA provides grant funding to the states, and the states have the primacy for both of those programs. We do do the programmatic reviews. Uh, for UIC, it's a mid-year and end-of-year review, and for NPDES, it's a five-year review. And um, I've reached out to both programs and spoke with uh, the folks that are running those programs and doing the oversight. And, um, you know, for UIC, uh, all aquifer exemptions have to be approved by the EPA. And aquifer exemption is if you're going to inject into a USDW. And that's an aquifer that has 10,000 parts per mil, per, uh, 10,000 parts per uh, ppm uh, or less TDS. And I'll say for EPA, we're taking a stronger stance, um, particularly because of climate change impacts when we're making decisions around approvals of aquifer exemptions. The flip of that is um, in the state of Colorado actually has uh, more protective, they're more stringent than EPA is for aquifer exemptions. Uh, for the NPDES program, Colorado has primacy except in Indian country and for federal facilities. Um, like I said, they receive grant funding, they run the program. We do the five-year review. Um, and in between, that those five-year reviews, we review selected permits. Um, all produced water discharge permits issued by the state of Colorado are being reviewed. And around, as far as conflicts, barriers, and opportunities, um, from the discussions I've had with the programs, I haven't really identified any conflicts or barriers that we would have authorities to address. As far as opportunities though, in the NEPA program, EPA continues to recommend reuse of produced water within the oil field to reduce consumption of freshwater resources. Um, we tie these comments sp specifically to climate change um, mitigation that's needed. And that is pretty much sums it up. We don't. You know, I feel like it really is in the state's hands because they have primacy of these programs um, and certainly the coordination with the state engineer's office who permits freshwater reuse, or I'm sorry, freshwater use. I think that's where 
you know, that's where you're going to have the impact is with the state programs. So hopefully that's helpful. Great. And, and as you, as you reviewed the uh, draft, did you feel like the draft captured at least current state of um, how EPA, um, well, EPA's purview, I guess, or, or processes in current state, understanding yeah. we're not going to, we're not going to rewrite all of the rules in our, in our document here, right? But. Right. And I'll be honest, uh, I'm still working on our section and I'm going to be working on it and have the programs review it. So I think it will, though. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Fair enough. Um, OK, I'm going to go to John Heil. Hey, yeah, good morning. So. Generally, looking over at the first draft, I think things are looking very good so far. Um, specifically under the ECMC section, I was thinking it could be beneficial to maybe touch on the 600 series, which deals with the storage of produced water, um, specifically in tank batteries. Um, it looks like the 900 series is covered, so that basically deals with you know, the storage of produced water in pits. So I think that's looking good so far. Um, another section that kind of caught my eye was the uh, cooperative agreements. Uh, we have MOUs and MOAs with CDPHE and the Water Quality Control Division, um, as well as the EPA. Those seem to be a little outdated. Um, they were created, you know, it looks like in the late 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So I think it's really important that we touch on that and, um, you know, acknowledge that. And it could be a, a huge benefit to update some of those. Um, that could be a really good opportunity. Um, as far as conflicts and barriers, um, I wasn't really able to identify too many at this point. Uh, I reached out to our engineering staff who regulate uh, UIC class two wells. Um, I'm still waiting to hear back from them with regards to any opinions they have on that issue. But um, I think overall things are looking really good so far. And thanks for everyone for putting their hard work into this. So thank you. Great, thanks, John. Um, Brandy Honeycutt. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, I represent the Water Quality Control Division uh, under CDPHE. Uh, so I think the draft looks great too. I think one thing I may add, and perhaps this is for future, maybe we don't need to do this now, would be like a roadmap of our permitting process, if that would be beneficial to anyone, um, just to sort of like a high level process overview of what our permitting, uh, you know, steps look like. Um, I don't know if that would be helpful or not, but that's what I just thought of. Um, but yeah, I think that this document does a good job of um, exhibiting the regulations that we have for uh, discharges that could potentially be um, what, where we could potentially regulate discharges from produced water. Um, and it, you know, exhibits regulation 84, which currently is, it only pertains to domestic wastewater, but I think that showing sort of how we regulate water reuse in general in the state is a good thing to have in this document as sort of a guidance or roadmap for future uh, consideration for how we reuse produce water. So um, yeah, so far I think it looks great. Thanks, Brandy. Uh, Tessa? Yeah, um, so Tessa Sorensen, Energy Liaison, now, the interesting thing about this, and I think this is really great, let me preface it with that, is that um, a lot of the jurisdictional kind of Gordian knot we find here is because of ownership of the water um, stream itself. Um, that water stream itself is a not considered just water, right? It is considered water and waste. Um, and, and, it, and essentially, it is actually just considered waste. Um, so I think that is one of the most important things to distinguish here. Um, we still have some more work to do reviewing this and adding to it from CDPHE from the hazardous waste um, side of things, um, because uh, the Solid and Hazardous Waste Commission is the governing regulatory commission on this. The division is the Hazardous Materials and Waste Management Division, which is a mouthful, I know. Um, 
And so it really comes down to who owns it, who owns that stream. If the operator owns that stream, then that stream is uh, very governed by ECMC for the most part. Once that stream is then transferred in ownership, and it's easy to say the word sold, although more likely it is the operator is the one paying, right? To, to shift that stream out to someone else. Then it really becomes a combination of hazardous waste division and possibly water quality control division. Although usually it's more on the hazardous waste side than not. Um, and even when it is part of water quality, it also tends to involve hazardous waste at the same time. So it gets very, very complicated. I think that complexity is one of the biggest regulatory barriers we probably see right now um, on our side is the extreme complexity around ownership of that stream and classification of that stream. Um, so that that's the observations we've been able to make so far on this. And um, we're by no means done reviewing or adding to it, uh, but it is, I think that's kind of the initial thoughts there. Uh, I see I sparked multiple hands. Yeah, thanks, Tessa. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask to just hold questions uh, until we're we're done with the regulatory agencies, and then I'm gonna get right back to you. So keep your hands up. I'm gonna get back to you, but um, let me go to Tracy, and then and then we'll go to questions. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Um, so DWR staff, I think at this point, I want to limit our staff um, involvement to myself. Um, but I think I can handle the DWR part. Um, you know, I think what Tessa just said is, um, in my mind, pretty insightful about maybe the biggest barrier or um, lack of certainty or clarity of the path that maybe we need to make more make more clear, that we can make more clear as we go through these efforts. Um, you know, I guess I see DWR's part here is relatively narrow. I added a, a a little table on page, it's like pages 11 and 12 of the draft document about when a permit's required and when it isn't um, from the Division of Water Resources. So, but I do think that um, opportunities here are for these, the agencies to work together to try to make the path through the permitting maze, whatever that might be for the fate of this water to make that clear. Um, so it seems to me that that overall goal would be a good recommendation coming out of this deliverable for us to work together to help make that clear for everybody. I do wanna note, um, and this is somewhat reiterating, um, what Commissioner Mesner already said is that some of the draft recommendations I thought were going beyond the scope of what this document was supposed to do. And I found that to be worrisome and added some comments in the draft along those lines. I, you know, so I'll just re reiterate that I, I thought we'll wanna keep in mind what the goal of the document is when we're making recommendations, but that's all I have. Great, thanks, Tracy. Thank you. I love that term fate of the water. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it sounds very dramatic to me. But... <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, so we've got some questions. Uh, I'm going to start with Barbara Vasquez. I want to defer to Michael Freeman. He was, his hand was up first. Okay. Mike. Um, uh, thanks, Barbara. And thanks, John. Um, I was, Wondering, Tessa, if you could provide a little more explanation of, of the conflict you're talking about. I, 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 and I'm wondering if it relates to a question I have about um, where the subtitle C exemption continues or ends. Uh, my understanding is, of course, E&P waste would be exempt from subtitles. This is the hazardous waste requirements under RICRA, exempt from subtitle C. And that... Um, uh, sometime when in some cases if it starts it but as I understand it, Rickery at some point if you're recycling or re re reusing or recycling a waste it is status as hazardous waste may change and I'm kind of wondering if the reverse is true if it starts as exempted but it's sold 
and it still has characteristics or constituents, does it, you know, when does that line, when is that line crossed? And and maybe more importantly, is that part of the of the point you're making? I'm just not sure. Uh, sure, uh, Tessa Sorensen, it's a great question. Um, the answer to that is, it comes down to that word we were just talking about, fate. Um, the ultimate fate of the, you know, of the water and whatever might be in it uh, is what is under regulation here. ECMC regulates that unless you give it to someone that is not under ECMC's jurisdiction. Um, uh, the best example in the state would be if you have sold that water that was produced to a um, disposal service company um, who disposes of it through an impoundment. Um, uh, this happens a lot on the Western Slope. It goes through an evaporative impoundment. Um, and so, but that particular facility to impound it and evaporate it has to be regulated. That is regulated through the hazardous waste division. But not as a hazardous waste facility, right? Or It is a hazardous waste facility. Oh, because it is. Okay. All right. You have to do, do something with what comes out of the water. Got it. Okay. Which is waste and is so once you, so once you remove it from the produced water, whatever you're taking out does yes. qualify. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. That's it's really there helpful. to control okay. the contaminants. Okay. And their proper disposal, not the water, right? It's it's never the water that's problem. It's just right. like it's not it's not the wind isn't the problem. It's what the wind is blowing usually, right? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. And does that relate at all to the ownership question, or is it really just? Um, what's happening to the produced water and how, you know, whether it's being treated or what's coming out of it. I think it's the, the fate of the, of the fluid. Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. But the ownership of course controls where that's going. Uh, Barbara. Sure. Thanks. Um, three things to say. One, I uh, accept the personal scolding. I think some of my comments were, uh, the uh, the point of uh, comments by Tracy and, and you, John, uh, I continue to try and make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that um, we still don't know um, all of the risks associated with produced water. And I will try and be more um, pointed in assuring that those comments go into a document that uh, should house them. Uh, second, uh, the question on ownership. Uh, Tessa, your comment about it's currently not sold, but you pay to have it disposed of because it's the waste. And I'm looking forward to imagining this becomes um, a commodity of value um, for that treatment and reuse, focused first on within industry, but perhaps later outside. Just read an article yesterday talking about produced water being a gold mine and using CO2 for treating the produced water to, to precipitate out various minerals, including potentially lithium. I know you, University of Wyoming is doing work in that area. So again, looking long-term, um, uh, whatever language we use to talk about the produced water, I think we need to make sure to include selling as well as paying to dispose of. And the other comment I wanted to make, I think the idea of a roadmap and maybe even some Venn diagrams to show the complex interactions of the various agencies would really help those of us who are not steeped in the, the legalese to understand how these different organizations and their responsibilities intersect or conflict uh, to, to um, polish a better document about this um, oversight and cooperation. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, Harmony? Oh, geez. Um, so just so many things, and I get that we're in a government process, we're looking into government things, but in the creation of this legislation, we had a lot of conversations about the ethics of water. Um, someone who uses the water to the point of extinction, uh, ownership of water in general with a lot of people feeling like the water belongs to the earth and the water belongs to all. But I get that Colorado has different rules and there's the rules of man and then there's the rules of nature. I had an indigenous woman reach out to me this week who says she's been listening into these meetings but doesn't find it meaningful to participate where maybe we get to talk at 
she gets to talk at us for three minutes and no one really talks back to her and she feels really discouraged on this process. I also see that there it is harder for a lot of our environmental voices and indigenous perspectives of what we were hoping when we shaped this of what that would look like are not necessarily here today. Um, so I just want to flag that in all these conversations as we talk about water, water ownership is that I wish there, if there were also faith based groups that we did a lot of circling with um, who applied for this consortium that didn't make it on there as well. Irene was part of a lot of these conversations and within a lot of these circles as well. Um, so I just flag that as when we think about these ideas of the water as water becomes scarcer, as water is a commodity. And because I sat in boardrooms in oil and gas where we talked about selling the water back to the people of North Dakota because we used all their water. Um, you know, as we sit here today, I think there's a lot of things that I'm always going to be pushing to rematriarch, look at things holistically, and think that the way that we've been doing things have been definitely missing a lot of voices, a lot of perspectives. And we are not in a good position today in my opinion, when it comes to what we do with the water, what we do with our planet and what we do with the earth and encourage us to kind of step outside of our traditional boxes that we're in and try to think a little bit broader as well and incorporate ethics, rematriarching, holistic, indigenous wisdom and figure out how to do that more meaningfully. Uh, appreciate the com comments, Harmony. It would be helpful for me if you actually had suggestions in those in those veins on how to improve the deliverable that we're working on. Um, Irene? Um, hi, thanks. And thanks for putting this document together. It is endlessly helpful. And I think you did a really great job. Um, one thing I'm not clear about is what group would be the one that would be responsible for setting the standards for um, um, reuse of water for like power and resources, industry, um, manufacturing, and agriculture. Who, what group is going to set those standards and um, be responsible for that? Was that a clear question? Um, it was a little clear to me, but maybe um, someone with more expertise than I do can uh, jump in and provide their thoughts on that. I'm happy to make an initial kind of maybe combination comment and clarifying question, Irene. Uh, Tessa Sorensen here. Um, yeah. This, you know, what we're tasked with doing as a consortium is to, you know, increase and promote, find ways to promote and increase reuse and recycling, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that could be done in several ways. Um, broadly, obviously, I don't have specific solutions or else we wouldn't have to have this. Consortium. <laughs> um, what what I mean though is that there are ways to have the actual stream of produced water be classified and regulated or controlled or encouraged to be treated. Um, because if you create a resource stream, then it can be used by the appropriate industries that might be able to utilize that using their own regulations mm -hmm. and their own rules. And I would posit that that's where this consortium should stop is not necessarily looking at the other industries that could take it, but looking at how do we make it so that produced water goes from being this very complex regulated disposal stream mm -hmm. in almost all cases to a product. Right, a usable exactly. Product. So, mm -hmm. um, and if that were wholly within the oil and gas industry, I would suggest that would mostly be uh, uh, either if it's federal than federal or, or um, the ECMC. Uh, in, but those water standards would obviously have to be coordinated across the water agencies, such as the ownership with um, Tracy Koslov's uh, department and um, the actual control of the quality, which is hazardous waste usually. On so hazardous waste. waste will be setting the standards for these products? For it's the what? waste that comes out of it. It's the contaminants we tend to, we, we forget to talk about. We talk about water. It's the contaminants that I think are the biggest issue. Contaminants right. are a waste stream, regardless of how we treat produced water, whatever you filter out of it, you have to dispose of properly. And that is a waste product. Correct. But right. what, when, who will set the, what organization sets this, the requirements for the, the cleanliness, for lack of a better word, of um, the produced water so that it could be used as a product in the different um, potential areas. 
there's so many of us on the call that I think could answer this better than I could. I will start that answer by saying, obviously, divisions within CDP, it, it has to be more than one. It has to be more than one. Just kind of period. There, there's not one agency, I think, in answer that can okay. do that. Thank you. Does anyone have any other thoughts on that particular topic that Irina brought up? Well, oh. I guess this is Tracy Kozlov. Tracy. Right. And, that, and I guess just to try to directly answer Irene's question, I think that would be the Water Quality Control Commission. And I, I'm looking at Brandy because that's really more in her wheelhouse. But, um, you know, if you are going to discharge the water to the stream, there are uh, stream water quality standards set by the Water Quality Control Commission. So discharge to the stream followed by somebody using that water downstream, Water Quality Control Commission and their stream discharge, um, their stream water quality standards. And then I there perhaps there would be an option for like a direct reuse for industrial or those other types of uses you mentioned. Um, it would be the Safe Drinking Water Act for, I guess, potable uses. But for the other ones, maybe, Brandy, you could describe what the water quality standards are for those non-potable use types. Yes, and I agree with uh, Tessa, this is Brandy Honeycutt, that it would involve more than one agency. Um, and I also agree with Tracy, if the fate of the discharge uh, or produce water was going to be a surface water discharge, then that would be under the Water Quality Control Commission's regulations. So we have a couple of regulations. One of one of them is for our point source discharges, and those regulate just effluent that comes straight out of any type of discharge into the river. They're kind of basic high-level standards for, for surface water and groundwater discharges. We have separate surface water regulations for each major river basin as well. And the standards in those regulations are set based on things like, um, you know, is there aquatic life that is um, in danger that we need to consider in the water quality effluent of the discharges that go into that part of the river? Um, is the water used close by for a drinking water source? So we need to consider what's discharged into the river for protecting the section of the river that's going into the drinking water intake. So those are the types of things that our uh, specific surface water discharge regs um, consider. Uh, and then we have our groundwater standards, which um, again, we set the standards, um, but the hazardous waste department division would um, regulate any produce water discharge that goes into groundwater. So our, like a, we set the standards, they regulate it. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, and I, you know, I agree with with the the idea of you know, depending on what the fate of the water and if it's going into groundwater versus surface water, um, and the idea that we're looking at contaminants versus water. I think when it comes to a water reuse regulation, I I think it would be wise. Obviously, the Water Quality Control Division should be involved in in that because we have experience in water reuse generally. Um, but I don't know which agency that would live under. So <laughs> I think that's a good question. Thanks for those responses. I think that's a good discussion. And I think, you know, I think that discussion hits on two different things. So one is, you know, is there opportunities to identify um, better regulatory coordination to address questions like you brought up, Irene? And then I think that there's another piece there is, um, you know, what, what are some things that we can employ, some recommendations we could make to employ opportunities for clarity on, um, you know, what standards are necessary for, for, for the fit for use of that water, right? And so I think that's a different deliverable, but I think these two things talk to one another, right? And so I think it's a, it's a good topic to bring up. Uh, Jolie? 
Thank you very much. Um, great conversation. And it just has me thinking about when we talk about different definitions, different uses, and how we're speaking about this today. I'm hearing the word ownership a lot, but I'm not hearing the word responsibility. And so I think there's something to be said too about ownership of water. And as Tessa kind of pointed out, the ownership of the pollutants in the water, which is separate from the water because we've got water and the pollutants, ownership and responsibility versus ownership of water. Maybe no one owns the water as we were talking about, but who owns the pollutants? Who owns that responsibility? And so we, as we make these recommendations, I want us to also think of that too. I don't know which regulatory agencies are enforcing that ownership or responsibility or where that line is for responsibility in current law and would really love to talk about those pieces or explore those further from my understanding. And maybe that's where we make some recommendations of who is responsible for not the water, the pollutants in the water. Someone is responsible for those. Someone has ownership of those. And so I'd love for as we continue these conversations, not to say the water is owned, but someone has responsibility and ownership for what they have put into the water. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those thoughts. Uh -huh. Definitely, I think one of the things that I noted in the draft was that there was um, some suggestions in there to um, to look at terminology that we utilize and have that consistent amongst agencies, and that made some sense to me. Um, and then I think that whether it's ownership, whether it's um, responsibility, whether it's liability, um, there's there's you know that that creates um, a, a lot of discussion as well, right? Because some some discussion needs to happen around when that transfer of liability happens, what that looks like, um, and you know who ultimately becomes responsible or or has that ownership of the water at different stages in the treatment process. And so these end up being big questions. Like the answers to those questions, I think lie in other deliverables. But I think that the conversation around like how agencies coordinate those conversations, you know, can live in, in this deliverable. So I think that's, those are good thoughts. Tessa? Yeah, so um, some quick comments here, uh, just in addition to what I kind of said earlier. The first is I wanted to really thank the um, public commenter um, who sent us a lot of good information this morning. It was extremely well thought out. I think it was very helpful. And it pointed out actually, some directions that my own department does need to look a little more in for produced water in terms of the air regulation um, for this deliverable. So I want to I want to show some excellent gratitude there because I thought it was it was so well done. Um, I also want to mention that we're talking a lot. I hear the word fate being thrown around a lot here, and I think it's an excellent word. And I think we should keep it um, and continue using it um, for for the fate of of the produced water stream. And I also want to point out we shouldn't be looking at we we're trying to find out what the regulations are for the various fates of that water, not so that we can rewrite those regulations, but so that we can identify where they're missing and where they could be simpler, right? We're not looking at adding uh, um, or rewriting these. We're looking at streamlining and filling in the gaps um, to enable it. So I wanted to point that out that the reason we're compiling all of these regulations, all of these uh, permitting processes is not to change those processes, but to make them work better with each other. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point that out for the group um, of what we're trying to accomplish. I think anything beyond that is a bigger and more complicated question um, on that side. Um, but that's, I'd be curious to know if anyone thinks of between now and the next meeting, what are fates that are not thought of or regulated or enabled yet? Good thoughts, Tessa. Appreciate your um, input. So I think I think the next step is, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna poke here just a little bit um, because as I as I looked at the drafts and I looked at the comments associated with the drafts, there's voices from this consortium that are missing in those comments and um, and engaging in the draft. And so certainly, uh, you know, some of the initial thoughts that helped develop 
um, you know, why we should ha be having this conversation about how agencies better coordinate with one another uh, came from folks that uh, were produced water professionals or from industry. And except for the written public comment that was provided by Karis, I didn't see a lot of input being provided by um, representation here from the produced water experts and, uh, and industry. So I think that that ends up being important because you are the ones that uh, are proposing projects and are running into maybe some um, challenges associated with clarity on uh, the regulatory paths necessary. And so I would encourage you uh, to engage in the draft and, um, uh, and certainly provide comments at the consortium meeting as well. Um, but I do want to open it up now that we've heard from the regulatory agencies on, you know, uh, additional thoughts on direction, on the draft, um, so that we do provide uh, the director with some um, some more information to walk away from the meeting with to continue to evolve the draft. Any other thoughts? Commissioner Pinter? Yeah, just a clarifying question, thank you. Um, I had a, in looking at the draft, it's full of comments already, which is great. And a lot of them are thoughtful and a lot of them prompt, qu prompted questions for me to consider. Um, but I'm kind of curious, usually when working on a draft like this, you are have, have an opportunity to go through iterations. Like the, these, these questions have been posed, they're integrated. We reconsider questions are posed, they're integrated. And I'm just kind of curious, like if you're advising us to continue to pile on or if there will be a little bit more of an iterative process to how the, the comments are integrated. Hope. Oh. Hope Dalton, Director. Thank you, Commissioner Pinter, for that question. I too have thought, what would I like, <laughs> right? And um, everything moves so fast in this operational year, and I do feel like we're building the the plane as we're trying to fly it. So I really sincerely appreciate this kind of slowing down of the process. I would, after this meeting um like the comments to take a break for the weekend and then i would like to present we'll say a cleaned up version for for comments the problem is that i need to get the final draft to all of you by march 22nd march 25th and so I don't, honestly, I think if I were to take the first draft right now, I could incorporate most of the comments and then have a second draft to you by this afternoon. And uh, people can add additional comments that I haven't captured this following week so that I'll have a week to um, clean it up and get you that final draft. What do you think of that process? Commissioner Pinter? I'm great. Thank you. That's helpful to hear how, like, how the iterations will be handled. Thank you, Hope. Hope, I wonder, is it helpful as well? I mean, as I look at that document and I, I you know, the chains sometimes are, well, at least for me, hard, hard to follow sometimes and tying them back into the specific sections. And I know that you're doing a good job of tracking all of that. And, um, but if someone had just kind of bigger comments that may uh, on on contents associated with the draft do you think it's appropriate for them to you know provide that in a separate document to you for incorporation or do you think it's important that that be in kind of the shared document so that folks are able to see other folks comments? uh hope Dalton director Thank you, Chair Messner. So my ideal world is that everyone would be able to see everyone's comments in a shared document. Uh, this has proven difficult and it has proven to be ideal. Not everyone has easy access to the Google Doc. <clears throat> I do receive some comments via email, 
some comments are based on a PDF that people are using. I am looking at potentially offering a shared document that is based in Microsoft Word. So the ideal, Chair Messner, is that we will all see the documents and there's no, and there's full transparency. So I would like to discourage the, the separate documents and creating more documents that, that encounter this sharing issue again. So. Okay. No, that's good. I mean, that's why I asked the question. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And so I appreciate that. Um, we've got a number of questions here. So I'm just going to go. I think I saw Mark Hefta first. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a quick thanks to everybody. Uh, Mark Hefta. Thanks, Jeremy. A uh, quick couple quick comments. Yeah, I do want to reiterate um, like Harris's letter uh, comment this morning. I think I received this morning. Uh, there are some great points in there, and uh, uh, I think that deserves a lot of consideration. I think the main thing I want to highlight is uh, uh, really this: this uh, the current form of the document doesn't really address any in interactions with state and or, uh, with county and, and and city governments. You know, we have a lot of hurdles related to uh, county permitting as well that goes into Bruce Water. Is that something that we can? address into this or it gets a little specific just to, to each county i know they have different rules and requirements but that i think that is you know that is one big hurdle that we're we're fighting in addition to other uh you know um statewide type regulations um, so it would be nice to have a county some some acknowledgement that county and other regulations do impact our operations and ability to recycle thanks thanks mark um Appreciate the comments. I mean, I think um, certainly, you know, all local government jurisdictions have land use authority and uh, have been, um, um, and I think it's important to acknowledge and embrace that they have local authority over land use decisions at their level. And so, um, and so while, you know, at this level, we certainly have local government representation here. And so I think that I will leave it to the local government representatives to provide thoughts or whether that should be incorporated or not. Um, you know, under current regulations, certainly the state doesn't have the authority to preempt local governments from their land use decisions associated with these activities. And um, I'm not going to be one to advocate for that. Uh, but um, but I understand that there are some challenges there. And so maybe there's some opportunities for coordination uh, between state, federal and local governments on some of these topics. And so I think that's certainly something that could be part of the conversation. And so appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that particular topic. You might, if, if you're going to talk about that topic, you might have to just, uh, unmute yourself and let me know. Cause I'm not sure which hands are for which topic at this point. So, oh. Uh, Chair Messner, I will defer to Commissioner Pinter and um, Mayor Strody, but I can add to the document at least an acknowledgement that uh, local land use authorities exist <clears throat> and um, kind of a paragraph stating this is the current state of regulations that although there are federal and state, we can also acknowledge that local land use agencies play a role, but without going into great detail. Uh, Commissioner Pinter, do you have comments on that? Um, thank you, Commissioner Emma Pinter, Adams County. Um, I, I would have to defer to how things are processed currently around um, land use authority in local areas such as siting, um, noise, um, structure setbacks are currently local authority. And I think that speaking from many years uh, previously on the CML Policy Council and with CCI and CCAT, that local governments really do prefer to keep local control that's previously been granted to them. And so would be really interested in how we navigate that balance. And again, that sort of goes back to 
previous comments on that flow chart of how all the different regulatory agencies might interact. Thanks for those thoughts. Mayor, um, Mayor Strody, did you have any comments for me? You know, not necessarily. I, I, you know, as a representative of, of a municipality, it's uh, it's not on our level per se. It's it's at the county, and I think, um, at least from what I've seen, there is variation in county process and um, uh, county uh, discretion in in uh, what's acceptable and what's desired. So, to get down to to the county level. I, I, I think it's a little tricky and a little more nuanced, but I, I once I hear that, you know, I think it should be included at least as a statement that that is part of the process that is part of the uh, permitting application and workflow of things. Thoughts? Brandy? Yes, thank you. And this was, I raised my hand before the local government comment. So this is pertaining to suggestion for the draft deliverable. And I'm wondering if other members agree that it would be helpful to have a visual aid showing um, sort of the interagency um, interactions and perhaps like a decision tree of sorts. I'm just kind of brainstorming out loud um, just to show sort of like where certain decisions would be made and a visual aid of like who's res responsible or the, of the fate of the water and that kind of thing. I'm wondering if that would be helpful. I think it would help me. <laughs> it would help me as well. Uh, so I think it's a great idea. Uh, Mike. And I, I, I want to I get through these questions and then I do want to take a 15 minute break because I'm sure that um, some folks need to step away uh, for a second. And so we've got a few questions here. I don't want to, we'll get back to the discussion. I just want to take a break here in a second. So. Sure. Um, so Hope, thanks for putting this draft together. I just had a real quick process question following up on uh, your exchange with Commissioner Pinter. Is the plan to have another draft circulating with that kind of incorporates the current feedback next week and then we have a final one uh, the following week? Or I, I just want to make sure I, I understand what, what you're thinking, so we're um, all on the same page. I hope Dalton, Director, thank you, Michael. Uh, since I was stream of consciousness when I answered that question, thank you for asking for clarification. So today I am trying to capture all of the comments that are being shared, and I will do my best to incorporate all the comments I heard today and send a second draft out this afternoon. I would like the consortium members to take the next week to just verify that I captured everything that we've discussed. And um, then I would take the following week, which is the week of March 18th, and I would take all of the comments that the consortium members have made uh, thus far and create a second draft to share with you by the end of the week. That's two weeks prior to our April meeting. And so you'll have two weeks prior to our April meeting to make your final edits. And then at the April meeting, we will discuss and finalize the report. Of course, just like we did with the first deliverable, I expect there to be a robust discussion at our April meeting. I'll take all of those comments and finalize the report for delivery by May 1st. That sounds great, thank you. Mm -hmm. John? Thank you, uh, John Lipka with uh, Evergreen Natural Resources uh, in the Raton Basin. Um, first comment, I think a, a, a placeholder for local agencies is not only important, it's critical. Having gone through a wildland fire down here, I can tell you right now what they needed was produced water um, to protect uh, infrastructure owned by uh, uh, state, local, and federal lands. Uh, the helicopters needed access to water. The pumper trucks needed access to water. So the interaction with local agencies, I believe, is important. You don't have to necessarily list them all, but at least putting a placeholder would be a, a benefit. 
uh, the, the continued effort to uh, deconflict uh, government expertise is um, a value. Uh, being an operator, I think you're starting to see the many different agencies, state, local, and federal, we deal with on any one particular agency. So if a, a champion or a lead for a particular issue is identified, that would be certainly helpful. And then that champion would also have the responsibility to liaise with the other state, local, and federal agencies that are also um, in, involved in that particular issue. If, the, if an agency sets a standard and another agency regulates or another agency enforces it, it would be nice to have that identified as a lead agency for setting the standard. Interpreting the standard is another important issue uh, for people so that uh, the standard is, uh, is printed, but then there's always questions about interpretation, uh, regulation, and enforcement. Uh, permitting is uh, of interest. Uh, if somebody uh, would list what specifically each permit each agency is responsible for, uh, the type of permit and who approves it, the length of the permit, that would be uh, helpful. I think we're all seeing the complexity of these issues are involved in. And the, uh, the last issue I have is um, uh, it's just not pollutants. It's the minerals that are in the water. Um, it's just um, uh, the, the minerals that come out of the produced water uh, that uh, most of the people in this call are aware of that. It's not that, that uh, the industry is, is, is injecting them or, or adding them to that. So uh, I take a little bit of umbrage. Uh, there's uh, the actual water content. There's uh, ingredients, but there's also minerals. And I think I like that term terminology better, the minerals that uh, are in the water as it comes out. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks for your thoughts, John. Tracy? Thank you, Tracy Kozlov, State Engineer's Office. <clears throat> Sorry, I raised my hand in response to Brandy's suggestion of a visual aid. Uh, so I agree that a visual aid flowchart or something to that effect would be helpful overall. Um, I'm not sure if we can complete um, the end goal visual aid by May 1 with this deliverable. But if we can't do it in time, it seems like that would be a, a, another good recommendation in this deliverable that the agencies work together to finalize a very helpful visual aid. So I guess I just wanted to distinguish that, um, but also say both Eric and I, and I showed a draft version of a flow chart that had been developed in 2016 timeframe. And I'd be happy if the other agencies have the time before May 1 to meet a couple of times to see if we can make strides on improving and updating that flow chart. I guess I would um, just mention, I, I think a lot of that falls in the CDPAG realm with so many different divisions having a hand in different parts of the regulatory process that I, I think a lot of work would need to happen on the CDPAG side and the different divisions to really finalize that flow chart. So I just wanted to say, I'm not sure it's realistic for May 1 to finalize that, but that could be a good recommendation and I'd be happy to work to make steps to get us there. Right. Thanks, Tracy. I think that's a really good suggestion and, and good perspective. So thanks for that. Um, we're going to take a break here quick. Uh, hold your questions. I'll get back to you. Um, it's 1051. Let's break until 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll, I think, then hear from Executive Director Gibbs um, for some uh, comments, and then we'll get back into this discussion following that. So uh, we'll see everyone back here at 11. So thanks. I'm going to go ahead and get started again. Um, Hope, do you know if Dan's joined us? I don't know yet. Aaron Ray, are you on the call? I am, and I'm looking to see if Dan has joined. I don't see him yet, but I am chatting with him. So um, hopefully in just a moment. Aaron, you want us to wait? Uh, is he going to be quick or should we continue the conversation and then just 
take a I'll take a pause if when he gets here. Why don't you keep the conversation going if you're willing to pause when Dan joins? That would be fine with me. Sure. Will you ping me when you see him uh, join? That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, we'll do. Um, so we had a couple questions uh, to wrap up this conversation. Um, well, it doesn't have to wrap up the conversation, but we had a couple of questions. So uh, we had one question, I think, from Barbara Vasquez has got her hand up. And then Harmony, you also have your hand up. Harmony, you visualize first, so go ahead. I was just giving comment to the earlier statement about minerals. And I guess I was just hoping for somebody from CDPHE or EDF or EPA would be chiming in here instead of me. Um, and I just think that there's a lot of people, not, well, some of them aren't even here today, but we that don't have as much of an understanding of produced water. And I just really wanna highlight that there are radioactive materials, unknown known constituents, and there are additives put into the water. And I think it's really important that it's, there are minerals in the water, absolutely. I've seen the big chunk of iron that comes out after the water has been processed, but there are other things. And I really think that that's important um, as we move forward with conversations. There are many other water resources, regular water resources that have a lot of radionuclides in them and other things, and that's fine. We're taking care of it. Thank, thanks for the thoughts. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Barbara, did you have a question? Um, um, Dan's jumped on. Dan's here? Yep. Um, well, uh, then I will take a second to welcome Executive Director uh, of the Department of Natural Resources, Dan Gibbs. Uh, welcome, Dan, and uh, thanks for taking the time to be here today. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, can you all hear me all right? Yeah, okay, good. Well, happy Friday. Hope you're well. I see a lot of familiar faces. There's a few folks I, I don't know, so I just want to introduce myself quick. I'm Dan Gibbs. I'm the executive director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources. And we have um, quite a few different divisions that are housed within the DNR, um, six different divisions. And then there's special divisions, just like you all, um, that's housed within the EDO office. But in short, we handle everything in the state that deals with land, water, wildlife, minerals, and oil and gas. So it's pretty broad. Um, I live up in Summit County in Breckenridge with my wife and two little kids and love to try to be outdoors as, as much as possible. So that's just a quick snapshot on me. And um, I just really wanna just take a couple quick minutes to really uh, take this time to thank you for your service, um, for your efforts to serve on the Colorado Produce Water Consortium. Um, you know, your your work is really essential to help meet our state's goals um, to really look at, you know, Senate Bill 1242 that passed a couple of years ago and um, really appreciate your work and really want to congratulate you all on, you know, meeting the first legislative deliverable uh, just, uh, just, what was it? Just, I'm trying to think of how many days ago, but just recently. And um, and when I look at you know the backgrounds of you all, you you come from such uh, diverse expertise, and I just um, really appreciate how you've come together. And I know you have other deliverables to produce later on, but um, really impressive to see, uh, just to say the least. Um, and I love to see um, the group of you know, of you all consisting of you know industry, environmental groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, locally impacted, disproportionately impacted communities, representatives from federal, state, local governments, you know, all coming together to find common ground. I I used to be a, a county commissioner, just like Chairman Mesner. And, you know, I feel like um, to get anything done, we really had to work with all different levels of government and nonprofits and you name it to get to get work done. And when I see the, the backgrounds of you all, you, you all you know come with those unique perspectives. So, um, want to thank the leadership of Chairman Mesner, of course. Thanks for stepping up to be uh, chair. Um, also, want to thank uh, Director Hope Dalton. We, you've really hit the ground running, Hope. So, so thank you for your leadership. And also, want to welcome new Assistant Director Aaron Sedlako. Aaron, I know you're here too. So it's great to. Um, meet you in person last week too. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention and thank Aaron Ray. Aaron's my assistant director for energy 
uh, innovation, and he is just a, a, a total rock star, to say the least, um, part of my my DNR family. Um, but I see Tracy Claus off here, too, acting director for Division of Water Resources and many others that I work very closely with. So just wanted to, again, you know, thank you for your service. Thanks for everything that you're doing for this um, really important work on how we really use water so wisely. You look at uh, climate change and the challenges we have and and the work that you're you're doing is is impactful and and really important. So happy to answer any questions, but really just wanted to take a couple quick minutes to say thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Executive Director Gibbs. Uh, certainly appreciate um, you taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Uh, consortium members, does anyone have questions? Uh, for Executive Director Gibbs. Well, thank you again for being here, taking your time out of the day, uh, taking time out of your day. And uh, um, we look forward to continuing to work together to um, to move forward with the important work that we're doing. So thanks for being here. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, I know we're a few, few uh, hours away from the weekend, but I hope uh, you all have a safe and wonderful weekend too. Great. Thank you. Here. Okay. Um, let's see, where were we? We were we were talking about deliverable two. And so I think we were having a pretty good conversation uh, um, about I think Tracy brought up some good points as far as you know the steps we need to take to create a deliverable or um, um uh what am I trying to say? A, a pathway of um, a flow chart or visual? Yeah, that's visual um, associated with it. It's been one of those days. And so I think that was a really good idea. Um, Barbara, I think you had a question. No, I just wanted to follow up on uh, the multiple comments, including Tracy's uh, long one right at the end before we took a break on making a visual. I'm hoping that those of you who have the expertise could take the time, but my suggestion would be if we could create a second shared document where this can be a work product that evolves over time to give those of us who are less steeped in the regulatory uh, agency uh, language to understand how this all works currently and have opportunity to see how it might be improved. So thank you for the suggestion and hope we can see something to educate ourselves. Does anyone else have thoughts on uh, the draft associated with deliverable two that they'd like to bring up today um, before we kind of wrap up this conversation? This obviously is not the last conversation we're gonna have on this and uh, certainly encourage everyone's um, communication and input associated with uh, the development of future drafts as Hope has lined out. Um, Kevin, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Uh, Kevin Chan, um, disproportionately impacted neighborhoods and um, people of color. Um, I, I guess when when I'm reading this draft, it's, it's about, it, it kind of states a lot of background around each agency's and their respective areas of responsibilities. Um, and really, I, I think from the title, it, it essentially says, how are we going to coordinate this? Um, but I'm, I'm reading through it and trying to figure out where the community voices come in and how do we, um, I guess, influence or have a say or, you know, just kind of voice concerns you know if anybody in the community does have that um you know the 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 how do we work together section is very scant right now and i know that it's only a draft um but i i i think some of the 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 issues that i've had in the past with just these multiple agencies and you know harnessing minerals in general is that we have it's very disparate and, and it's kind of like we have to pull everybody into a room is what I feel like um, to get any type of answer like 
instead of you know maybe showing up at one one department's event and then they they will refer me to another department. Um, so I, I I know that this is kind of like long rant, but I, I don't know how else to kind of con convey it in you know this document since like it's it's very background heavy and it, it does list a lot of you know the regulations that are kind of in place. So just just want to throw that out there. And, you know, maybe I'll talk to Director uh, Dalton. Um, you know, through an email. Kevin, I think you bring up a really good point. Is uh, you know, as we talk about how agencies can better coordinate with one another, it's not just to coordinate with one another to accomplish, um, you know, permitting, but it should also be some conversation I think could be contemplated as far as how agencies can better coordinate to um, you know, encourage community involvement and in some decision-making. And so I think you bring up a good point and something that I think we should consider having uh, in our recommendations. So I appreciate that. Tessa? Uh, I just wanted to add to that and acknowledge that that's so well put, Kevin. Um, uh, I'd like to ask the, the members uh, uh, of the consortium who are representing um, disproportionately impacted communities and just communities in general uh, to possibly uh, in this document or even as something that could be added to a different document sent to the director, um, ideas for streamlining community involvement um, on, the, on the part of regulatory agents. I don't mean community members doing more work, I mean, what would be solutions that would streamline community involvement for you on behalf of regulatory bodies that just ideas there. I think there does need to be some ideas there that can be looked at and added to recommendations by this consortium. So. Great. Other thoughts before we wrap up this conversation until the next draft? Hope, do you want to chime in and acknowledge that you've received uh, enough information or if you have any clarification on comments or direction that you might need in order to uh, start working on the next steps? Uh, thank you, Chair Messner, and thank you to everyone who, who uh, participated in this discussion today. I believe I've captured all of the comments. I have pinged a couple of you to make sure that I captured your comments correctly. To the current, the most recent discussion on a separate document, I think that's going to be just um, a really great idea, but difficult to implement right now. I'm going to explore if I can implement it and still keep our our timeline. So um, I do think it's important to discuss how we interact with the communities and capture that community voice. I, I really would appreciate if people who work with the community directly could give me language of um, how the state is currently working to with their outreach for communities so that that'll make it a little bit quicker, similar to the approach that I plan to take by acknowledging local authority over, over uh, different aspects of of produced water. So I could at least acknowledge the current approach that state agencies and federal agencies use to, to um, interact with communities, which might capture what Kevin was saying that it might be, it might feel disjointed. So I think that's the approach. I appreciate everyone's comments. If you didn't have a chance to share it right now, please reach out to me within the next week. 
Um, thank you, everyone, for that conversation. I think it's a good conversation and uh, um, continue to engage in the process and with hope and want to make sure that every voice on the consortium is heard in this process. And so I um, would encourage all of you to um, you know, read the draft and provide comments um, over the next week or two. So um, or within the timeline that Director Dalton just said, don't use my timeline. Um, hope you had another comment. Uh, I'm sorry, Chair Messner. Um, there's a chat conversation that's going on at the same time. It is difficult for me to look at all of the chats and uh, fully listen and participate in the conversation. So if you do have ideas, I do encourage you to raise your hand. In this case, I do want to pass the floor over to Harmony who is asking about alternatives to engaging that go beyond sitting in front of a community, I mean a computer. Harmony, are you available to discuss your ideas? Yes, um, but didn't necessarily want to talk about that at a group level. <laughs> um, but here we are. Uh, I made a comment earlier and we've asked for something earlier, some of us who are maybe not, don't have the same background, don't have the same resources, or maybe compensated very little to be here and have, this is not our general wheelhouse of our jobs. And so this is an extra thing that we're doing on top of all that, but to have meaningful like participation for like, Kevin and Nikki and myself and Jolie, um, she's got a bit more research, but we had asked for the idea of like a study group or a way where we can get together to talk through these sort of things. So it feels less, less daunting. We can ask our, some, I know we're not supposed, but like our questions that maybe we don't wanna take up time here in front, front of the whole group. And I think we didn't, that wasn't like an opportunity that was given to us or we didn't wanna put extra burdens on us already. So I think that our participation is getting less and less, but I'm hearing that there's groups getting together with you from industry to do something similar. And that's, ugh. <laughs> and so I'm asking that question again. Is there a way or a space other than sitting at my computer by myself after my kids go to bed, trying to add comments into a place that's like talking into a void? because it doesn't feel the most protective or productive for, for me. I like to talk through things and have a dialogue. Who can I do that with? Are you the only person? But I'd love to do that with Kevin. I would love that to do that with Nikki, who Nikki's like, Harmony, I'm struggling to even open these documents. And so how do we really make this meaningful? Because I see the divide getting bigger instead of smaller. So I'll start. Uh, with some comments. Um, number one, there there has been zero conversations um, besides individual conversations between the director and different members of the consortium. And so this concept that there has been groups that have been meeting and breaking open meetings laws um, is a farce. And so I want to emphasize that. But um, but second of all, there's open meetings laws considerations. And we had long discussions about this before. And I think that you know, we have to, because we're a legislatively created consortium uh, that is bound by statute and the law, we do have to follow open meetings laws in our in our proceedings, you know, which we continue to do. Um, I do think Director Dalton is continuing to look at ways to develop subgroups and different conversations on some more complex topics um, and deliverables that are um, that are upcoming. And so I think she'll take some time over the next uh, meeting or two to kind of roll out how the subgroup concept um, can be laid out in a way that still um, meets open meeting law requirements, um, but does allow for smaller group discussions in order to be able to really um, have more in-depth discussions about particular topics that then would be able to be um, brought back to the full consortium for further large group discussions. And so certainly that um, thought has been heard uh, and we continue to work through ways to, to do that. These first couple of deliverables, I mean, I hate to say it, but these are not as complex as future deliverables. And so we didn't make a determination that some of these initial deliverables uh, necessitated um, subgroups associated with them. But I do think that those are forthcoming um, and so 
those are that's my initial thoughts on it. Hope I'm happy to hear your thoughts on it or any other consortium members' thoughts. Uh, so Harmony, I do appreciate you bringing this um, to the forefront. I, I do, John, want to acknowledge that uh, I'm not having any meetings with people except individually, and everyone is is encouraged to meet with me individually. Now that we have the assistant director, there can be three of us in the group. The meeting that I believe you are referring to is um, prior to our February meeting. I, I received a request from the produced water experts to host them as they discussed coordination of their presentations. So it was purely educational in nature. And so they just wanted to make sure that if one person was presenting on one topic, that the other person was not presenting on the same topic. And so I gave them a space to meet in, which was the ECMC building, and it was prior to our February meeting. Kevin? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that um, perhaps it, it, there's a lot of material. And as Harmony has said, you know, I, I do find it difficult to um, not only read through this, but actually understand it. I, I, I've, I've spoken about this many times to many people in different spaces that unless you're in this space 24 seven, um, a lot of this stuff is, is very high level. Um, even when I speak to well-educated people who have like maybe a master's or a PhD, it is very difficult. Um, lots of jargon and processes and history behind all these different, um, all these different, uh, regulations, you know, even in the document we're, we're, we're proofing right now, um, I, I think, a, you know, having work sessions would be helpful um, just so that um, they're scheduled, they're open. Um, and, you know, whoever wants to come can go ahead and, and read through it and do ask questions because my understanding may be completely different from someone else's. Um, and, you know, some of my questions, such as, you know, the background issue, um, I can go and raise that at, at the work session. Um, you know, I, I don't expect to be compensated for it, but it's just something that, you know, I mean, reading through these documents, I'm not even compensated for anyway. So I, I think having that ability, that space, um, especially for, you know, the groups that are not in the space completely, we, we just, you know, talk to our community members and report back and really try to bring their voices here. Um, I, I think that's very necessary. Um, I do. I think that's a good suggestion, and certainly it's something that um, Hope and I have talked about, whether there was a capacity or a willingness from consortium members to engage in meetings outside of uh, the main meetings so that we could have work sessions, educational topics. We also have educational topics lined up within meetings, right? And so we we got through a couple of them last week, and I'm hoping we get through the rest of them today, although we're running out of time here a little bit because we started late. But uh, Commissioner Pinter? Yeah, just a question. I wonder, and it doesn't have to be responded to immediately, but I feel like the hesitancy around communication in order to respect um, the process and sunshine laws and transparency and appropriately document our process being taken seriously by everyone. I do have questions on the differentiation between the meeting has to be publicly noticed, the meeting has to be recorded and participants have to be compensated. Because you know, when I work in my local government, um, and I'm gonna have to like put a dollar in my local government jar every time I say it, but like there's a difference in those items um, when we're thinking about county meetings, which also have to be public and, uh, and abide by CORA or Sunshine laws. And so I'm just trying to understand if we could have some differentiation. I think there might be a lot of people who are interested in a work study conversation. And if we can just meet that, it has to be publicly noticed threshold without the others, it might allow for a free flow of conversation, but then what are the rules and what are the parameters? 
I think I think that's a good point, and uh, let's put that on a future meeting date to discuss. Zahi. Uh, I think there are several of us from academia here that, uh, you know, doing a lot of research and, you know, acquired a lot of knowledge over the years in, in this in this field. And we talk all day long, so we can talk. And, you know, if people want to know more, we are, I think, always happy to provide knowledge, to provide information, and to maybe direct people to, you know, things that we don't know, you know, to, to direct them to the right resources. Um, you know, I think we are all happy to play this role um, in any form that people want to to have. Super helpful. Thank you for your willingness to do that. And I think that's exactly right. We've got a lot of expertise on the commission that can be shared. Um, James, and then and then I'm moving on to presentations and we're not going to get to your presentation, James. All right. Yeah, I'd just be real quick to say that support what Zahi said and you know with some of the tours coming up maybe that's an opportunity for maybe more of these directed conversations and just to kind of fill in the gaps I guess from an academic perspective but hopefully some folks in industry are there as well so there's maybe that's an opportunity to fill some of those knowledge gaps at those tours or they could be extended to again kind of have these education sessions if individuals are interested absolutely and really appreciate again all the different members of the consortium that are willing to provide um, information, you know, at these consortium meetings, and then the consideration to do it outside of it, whether it's tours or or uh, the concept of work sessions, which I think is a good one. So um, thanks for that. I am going to move on um, so that we do have some opportunity for um, for educational topics to be brought up here. And so uh, with that, our first presentation is from Clay Terry, who's a managing partner, natural resources advisors, consortium member, and he's given us a presentation on produced water management uh, and projects in oil field produced water treatment, recycle and reuse. Really appreciate um, Clay, uh, Cloel, and James being willing to present here today. So um, I will hand it off to you, Clay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Messner and uh, Director Dalton. I appreciate this opportunity. I'll just ask one question. Can you hear me adequately? Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Bar Thank you for the thumbs up, Barbara. Uh, the, the nature of my involvement uh, in the consortium really served as the basis for uh, this presentation. In no way shape or form am I prepared to give you an exhaustive commentary on uh, research, uh, treatment, recycling, and reuse of produced water um, from a completely authoritative point of view. But I, th I thought it would be helpful at least to uh, give you some sense of why I'm involved in the consortium, a little bit about my background, and things that I've witnessed and seen over a 40-year history in the oil and gas business. And over the course of the last decade and a half, uh, focused on uh, topics related to produced water research, uh, uh, treatment, recycling, and reuse, Pre predominantly the concept of what can we do to utilize this very valuable resource uh, in light of increasing populations, uh, in light of uh, finite freshwater resources, and recognizing the huge volume of, of uh, produced water or brackish waters uh, that are available to assist us with some of the needs that we have, both inside the industry and out. So I, I put a brief presentation together, uh, intending, again, to highlight some of the experiences that I've had, things that I've seen, projects that I've worked on, to give the members of the consortium who may not be um, as familiar with, with some of these concepts, the jargon that's given, uh, captured, um, and the history of things, um, to give you some some sense of where the industry's been uh, from my perspective. And I hope that that what this does is to give you an idea of again why I'm involved, and uh, uh, hopefully I have uh, a, a bit of insight that from time to time that may 
complement what the, the consortium is set out to do. Um, I, I'm a big fan of where the consort the, the formation of the consortium and where we're headed. And I applaud uh, not only all the participants that are here, but also the, the leadership that we have with Director Messner and, and uh, Director Dalton um, and all the participants who have, you know, real possible uh, inputs to this whole process. So I haven't said that. Um, I'll, I'll just take you through a, a brief ex, brief expose of some projects, technologies that I've reviewed, uh, things that I've learned through the processes, and hopefully give you some sense of the scale of of uh, processes necessary when we're dealing with uh, large volumes of of produced water. If you go to my next slide, there, please. So this is uh, a, a bit of a cartoon examination um, of, on the left there, a, a significant list of water treatment technologies and processes, some of which are common sense oriented, um, with some of them are high level uh, research targets. And, and the point of this is merely to say, there's a huge amount of technology out there, uh, some of which has been examined, uh, some of which has practical and economic you know, applications for the use of produced water in order to convert it uh, into a usable resource inside the oil field and, and outside the, the oil field as we go forward. Um, and, and on the bottom right of this slide is, is, a, is a bit of an expose of the relative cost of treatment versus uh, water quality value add by looking at a few different technologies, nothing Nothing exhaustive by any stretch, but on the lower left, you see just simple filtration processes for uh, uh, suspended solids removal, um, all the way to thermal processes in the upper right that have extreme water value, the quality value through the use of total dissolved solids reduction uh, and all the constituents extracted to a freshwater drinking standard if necessary, but the cost of that can be quite high. And we'll return to this in a, in a few things as we go forward um, in terms of uh, a couple of the technologies, but I just wanted you to see there's a there's a significant issue around the use of technology to treat water uh, for for uses in inside and outside the oil field, and there's a cost associated with that. And so not all technologies are the same. They don't accomplish the same things, um, and, and there are awful uh, differences, uh, significant differences in cost in the logistics of, of using them to accomplish our objectives. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this slide uh, and the, those that, that follow are just a, a, a brief lifting, listing of some of the things that I have uh, participated in or led uh, either as an employee of a, a large uh, oil field service company, Halliburton. I spent 20 years with Halliburton. Um, uh, and, and most recently as an energy, uh, energy development consultant, some of the things that I've, that I've worked on and experienced, and uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the things in my background, um, you can see that we're going to talk a little bit about mechanical vapor recompression, some of these technologies, electrocoagulation, uh, cavitation, and, and, and here's one in the end that, that I think is important to consider as a, as a, uh, produce water management technique is an alternative to salt water disposal is enhanced evaporation. It doesn't allow us to capture that water for reuse in oil field applications, but it certainly has the potential to eliminate some of the challenges uh, around injection. So next slide, please. I wanted to start uh, with a little bit of a focus on a project that's near and dear and, and you know, essentially outside Denver here in Arapahoe County. Um, back in 2019, um, I assisted a independent oil and gas operator by the name of Highlands Natural Resources, who wanted to develop uh, 16 horizontal wells on two eight well pads on mineral interests and acreage that they had uh, out East Quincy uh, area. And uh, we're looking for assistance in one, utilizing produced water, recycling produced water uh, on site uh, in an effort to reduce their 
uh, need for fresh water and the costs associated with acquiring it and transporting it, uh, you know, into that particular location uh, uh, east of uh, E-470 and south of DIA. Uh, they drilled uh, two original wells. Um, if you would uh, drop down to that next slide for just a second, uh, please. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a graphic, uh, multicolored uh, uh, display. It's essentially a decline curve uh, associated with produced water um, for that eight-wheel pad as a projection, as opposed to, or, or built off of the average of the first two uh, Niobrara wells, horizontal wells drilled. And the, the thing I want to point out here is that as a function of time, you, you'll see that somewhere in that range of 180 days, um, the large volumes of produced water that were in the flowback process uh, after the original completions diminished to a, a, a not negligible, but very much more manageable uh, uh, levels. And that's typical of the Niobrara formation in, in the horizontal development that, that currently uh, we see in the, in the industry and in the DJ Basin. And, and it gives us a few different things of insight that are that are noteworthy. But one is that that large volumes of, of produced water can be flown back early in the process of uh, well completions and and the preparation for uh, commercial production. But in, at least in the DJ, they're they're not uh, large volumes forever, like you obviously run into in places like the Permian Basin and even in the Appalachian Basin, and in some cases. So it can be a very manageable process as a function of time, uh, even with using relatively high cost technologies. Uh, the technology that we're describing here, mechanical vapor recompression is a thermal process. It essentially is a distillation and uh, it boils water uh, to eliminate the, the uh, total dissolved solids and, uh, and volatile organic compounds. Uh, associated that, or that may be co-produced with the water after original separation. And, and yet it can be quite expensive because as a thermal process, as you saw on the chart there uh, earlier in the presentation, it's, it's in the upper right-hand corner. And, and just to give you a sense of what that might entail, um, that distillation process uh, would be somewhere on the order of uh, $3.50 $3 to $4 per barrel of, of cost uh, if you're utilizing energy on the open market or on the grid, whether it be electrical uh, power to generate the, the MVR, mechanical vapor recompression technology, or even natural gas um, that was post sales point and uh, out, out of the market on the market uh, the pricing structure. One of the things that, that this technology could do, uh, just as they're looking at this chart, is to say that if we just focused on the early time in the flowback, um, and we were able to utilize, as an example, the uh, original natural gas being co-produced with the oil and the water during the cleanup phase, uh, capture that, and prior to us being able to be sold uh, under contract sales on the open market, but used on site uh, on the pad to uh, fuel the cost of mechanical vapor recompression or other technology, other thermal technologies like submerged combustion or, or others. It could be on a temporary scale. Uh, and, and if it were able to be permitted in that way, uh, it, it might provide a, a short term alternative to the, to the cost of, of thermal processes which can, and you can see from the, the diagram there, have the ability to create um, drinking water standard quality water. Now, uh, we all know that even though that's processed in that way to drinking water standards, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner, some of the results of this, uh, this program were well below uh, drinking water standards. Um, the fact is it's still called an EMP waste. And so I just point out that that remains to be a hurdle a barrier, as it will, as it were, to uh, the use of, of processes and things of this kind uh, that, that hopefully we can address as we move forward with the uh, uh, the consortium tasks and, and recommendations. Um, if you go back to the uh, the previous slide there just for a moment, 
If you look down the lower right hand corner, you'll see a aerial photograph of the uh, operational uh, setup on the on the uh, wild horse pad, and you'll see a large uh, open top uh, modular large volume tank on, on the lower right hand corner. That's the the the, the container that we processed the flowback fluids uh, into for storage on site and for use in ongoing fracturing operations. Uh, this was all accomplished, you know, through the appropriate uh, application and authorization of a waste management plan under COGCC. And also uh, in this particular case, even though we had a uh, VOC air stripper uh, capacity and we're using it, we had to, uh, we had to uh, be given a variance uh, from director uh, Devonlow at that time, which they granted for the purposes of, of this individual project to utilize an open uh, air storage container, although we were planning and did use all of the waters uh, processed, you know, in ongoing fracturing operations. But I, I just show that to give you an idea of the sense of the size and scale of the of the of the uh, containers and the, the processing uh, needs uh, uh, in order to accomplish uh, that kind of a project. I apologize for the fact uh, that, that some of these these data the tables are so small, but but we 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 uh, complied with all the uh, EPA and, and uh, uh, standards for drinking water uh, dissolution and extraction of dissolved solids, as well as uh, volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds. And I just point out that mechanical vapor recompression as an example of technology is a highly efficient uh, way to, to, to process water uh, on the order of 95% efficiencies. And, and, uh, and yet it, as we noted, can be quite high. As a closing comment on, on this particular uh, project, uh, if we were able to use uh, those flare gases during the completion program uh, uh, under a variance or a permit, short-term permitted opportunity, the cost of that, uh, pre predominantly because the, the natural gas uh, is not under a sales contract, but the cost of that operation could be as low as 50 cents a, a barrel that we were able to document during this, this pilot program. Um, if, you, if you go on to that, again, that next slide, uh, these are just some individual items that are uh, germane to the, the details of the project. Uh, some of the uh, sampling that was accomplished and the, the results that you see there and uh, the the, uh, the next slide gives a, a bit of an overview of the of the project um, as we laid it out and the uh, the accomplishments uh, that were laid there uh, that you that you saw in the, in the context of the uh, aerial photograph. In the interest of time, I would like to just move on to the to the next uh, slide and the next uh, example of technology. This is a a technology that. Um, during my tenure with Halliburton, I was tasked with uh, launching a, a service operation for Halliburton in the United States um, and, and predominantly in the Rocky Mountains for uh, water, uh, water solutions, Halliburton Water Solutions, in which we were attempting to uh, do exactly what the consortium is, is charged with here. And that was to find ways to utilize uh, flowback fluids and produce water uh, adequately for hydraulic fracturing needs. And we settled on initially a technology uh, called electrocoagulation, which is a, an excellent uh, total as solids removal technology. Um, and we were able to do that uh, essentially because in, in the era of the, the, the mid uh, 2000s, we were, we were seeing a shift in the industry uh, away from a, a a freshwater requirement for water uh, frac fluid water chemistry uh, to more uh, 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 fewer demands on water quality uh, for for the, due to the fact that we were developing salt tolerant uh, friction reducers, salt tolerant viscosifiers to help reduce injection pressures and carry propens into the, the fractures being created during the completion process, which are there to assist the well in terms of its uh, flowback and ultimate hydrocarbon production. 
And I want only to say that this is a particular uh, technology that has has promise, but there are some challenges associated with it. I'm sure that our associates with Select Energy and their Grant Tupper and, and Doug White and others that work with the uh, technologies and water process, produce water processing recognize that electrical coagulation is a is a valuable technology, um, but it has limits as well. Uh, it's a very cost effective technology, and it's it's really designed for not so much during the flowback period because of the challenges of extracting some of the long chain polymers and polysaccharides that are used for friction reducers and viscosifiers. But once those are extracted, uh, the longer term uh, uses of the produced water in itself are easily treated by uh, uh, electrocoagulation for ongoing uh, operations and produced water management. Uh, next slide, please. This is a, a slide that I just put together uh, designed to show you a little bit more, more of actually the, the scale of operations of handling uh, large volumes of water. This is a, a project that we conducted uh, uh, in association with uh, uh, local uh, contractors um, uh, under permit by the CDPHE for uh, processing and testing, uh, meeting, CDPHE discharge requirements uh, in, in the context of a pipeline uh, uh, construction hydro, hydro testing project in Upper Will County. And it, it's not, it, it is not the use of produced oil field produced water. It started out as fresh water, but in a hydro testing uh, arena, uh, you can imagine that uh, with welding slag and, and uh, the rust associated with moving water through uh, steel pipelines as they're being constructed. There are challenges to being able to clean that water up and then be able to dis dispose it on the on the surface according to CDPHE guidelines. And, and, and I really just put this in here to show you that the, the relative scale, uh, if you look at that uh, that photograph in the, in the midsection to the right, you see the, the water uh, being pumped into this uh, into this modular large volume tank. This happened to be a 30,000 barrel tank with a dimension of 135 feet in diameter. And you can imagine the, the large uh, volumes associated with, with uh, treating this water. It was a relatively simple operation using CO2 to uh, uh, oxidize the iron in the, in the water, to, to drop it out as rust, uh, to get below iron. Uh, ferric and ferrous iron ion con contents according to CDPHE standards. There were no oil or, or grease uh, associated with these things as, as validated in the as sampling and testing. And we essentially used CO2 to, uh, uh, to, to oxidize that iron for extraction through simple filtration uh, noted up there in the uh, identified in the top right photograph and reduce the pH to where a point it was stable and then could be discharged uh, through the bubble uh, distribution system uh, on the land uh, application that the CDPHE had, had granted. And I, again, I just I put this in here to show you the relative scale of uh, water treatment that sometimes is, is necessary when you're dealing with large volumes of, of water, whether it's an industrial application like this or produced water that we we're describing from wealth, wealth field applications. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to shift gears momentarily to, to, to talk just a little bit about uh, this technology uh, that's currently being uh, uh, researched and applied with a, a client of Mine Dominion Oil and Mining Exploration. Um, essentially, the combination of technologies sometimes can, can be synergistic, uh, have synergistic effects that, that pertain to being able to use uh, brackish waters or even oil field produced waters through the use of cavitation, uh, which is a venturi driven type process, you know, to create bubbles and extrude, extrude those bubbles with a release of energy uh, to, to assist in a bacterial kill. It's a very common uh, municipal water treatment technology, but coupling it with a band uh, uh, 
Um, the, um, a technology essentially uh, a band of filtration devices that will target particular molecular frequencies, in this case, targeting hydrogen bond frequencies, which allow for a targeting of, of hydrogen bonds between the individual water molecules to, to weaken them, uh, this, uh, essentially uh, disturb them to a point where the result is a significant increase, or excuse me, decrease in the interfacial tension in the water. It has uh, wide ranging ramifications from prevention of scale formation for uh, sprinkler irrigation uh, uh, materials uh, to plant hydration efficiency and lowering water requirements for irrigation and increasing plant yield through reduced you know, fertilizer volume requirements and a number of uh, other uh, technology uh, or, or benefits. Uh, and I just note down in the, in the bottom right here, a, a listing of a, a number of ongoing uh, pilot programs that this, that this synergy of technologies is being utilized to develop uh, in both these agricultural ir irrigation ir industries and distilleries and, and um, in an effort to, uh, to utilize water more efficiently. Uh, next slide, please. I turn I turn our interest here momentarily to a different water management uh, technology. Again, it's it's designed to produce an alternative or create an alternative to saltwater uh, injection, as noted in the upper left hand portion of, of this of this diagram. This is a project uh, conducted outside of Bill, Wyoming, with a uh, uh, produced water disposal company with open pit uh, uh, natural evaporation uh, permitted permitted capacities in which uh, high high rate fan uh, boundary layer disturbance evaporators were applied you know to assist with with uh, water and accelerate water evaporation Th this can be a, a very useful thing uh, Obviously, issues around controlling particulate matter um, and, and regulatory standards associated with that is, is essential. Um, but this, this technology has been permitted in, in those various states that you see there. And, and it's an excellent way to utilize technology to eliminate produced water as an alternative to uh, injection. And I say that's, that's, that's critical because uh, there is a move uh, to, to be concerned in the industry around seismicity that's created through injection uh, at high rates uh, and high pressures. And, uh, and these technologies assist with being able to, to eliminate a lot of the produced water that's not being used otherwise uh, for you know, beneficial purposes and reduce the, con the concerns over seismicity and those kinds of uh, efforts. It's also a way to concentrate uh, the, the minerals and the extraction of minerals, heavy metals, uh, rare earth metals, et cetera, that have commercial value as we were referring to earlier in today's conversations. So I, I just throw that out there as a, as a recognition that it's a technology that is, it is growing in, in terms of applications uh, across the Southwest for oil and gas operators uh, were permitted effectively. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up my in my presentation with the next couple of slides. Um, I, 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 this is a essentially a throwback to the Niobrara pilot project that we discussed earlier, and I wanted to to give you a sense of the fact that um, in assisting Highlands Natural Resources with their interest in uh, devising ways to utilize produced water. Uh, both to reduce the need for to fresh water and potentially to uh, ultimately uh, be in a place where they could discharge water to the to the surface um, uh, appropriately authorized, of course, uh, by the CDPHE. It was it was necessary to give us a sense of what's involved in moving from the idea of wellhead to end use uh, using permit using produced water and uh, i'll echo some of the things mentioned this morning that commissioner Press, uh, messner started out with that there's no really good 
obvious clear pathway to uh, to permitting um, and, and what's there uh, can be confusing. So we contracted a local uh, highly respected water engineering firm to create for us a, a flow chart um, that, that detailed the decision tree, so to speak, as necessary and uh, to navigate the whole process of permitting for ultimate reuse, recycling and reuse um, uh, of produced water in an effort to understand what would be involved and how easily could or difficult could that be navigated if Highlands Natural Resources wanted to do that. Um, I'm not going to read these uh, this flowchart to you, but you, you you can look at it yourself and and recognize the fact that that it it does involve multiple agencies. Um, it involves and and highlights some of the challenges that I have brought me to the consortium and that were to hopefully develop a roadmap that would allow operators to more easily navigate this process. Uh, if the objective of the consortium is actually to increase the, produce, the use of produced water and minimize the produce of, of fresh water, um, there are some things that, that need to be done. And, and I recognize that the consortium and all the members here are, are, are both aware of those things and committed to uh, developing important uh, options going forward that allow us to collaborate uh, you know, together for the purposes of accomplishing these objectives while producing, uh, while protecting the public and um, and certainly the environment um, at the same time. The, the last slide here is just the, 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 the balance of, of this flow chart showing that the different components um, of the permitting process as we understood them. If you could go to that last slide for me. And, and so what I'll just take away couple of things. Number one, there is a process, no question that there's a process to be able to be permitted uh, to use produced water. But you can see from, I, I think, the, the flow chart uh, and its various components here that it can be a very, a, a, a very a difficult project uh, to navigate. Uh, a gauntlet, in my own words, if, if you will. Uh, I, I will applaud our regulatory agencies, uh, both the federal and state agencies, uh, and even local governments. You've done a fantastic job of protecting the, the public. And, and essentially, uh, before this point in time, uh, devising a system that was designed to pr protect the public uh, becomes really a, a prohibitive process uh, in, in terms of its uh, ease of navigation. So I'm I'm all for, and, and, and this slide kind of captures some of the comments I've, I've witnessed today and through the different members of the consortium. We need to streamline the processes. We need to we need to uh, you know promote interagency collaboration, eliminate overlap, and um, maybe the idea that you know that uh, our new consortium member from the Earthstone Basin mentioned a while ago you'll pardon me for not remembering your name at the moment, but noted that we should have potentially a, a champion for each of the components and different challenges that multiple agencies have jurisdiction over uh, in an effort to help streamline some of these processes. And I'll just echo that we're not asking for, you know, changing or, or redrafting water quality requirements, but for innovation and cooperation in the logistics and handling of, of produced water uh, if we're going to meet these objectives and, and help the legislature recognize what's necessary in order to actually increase the use of produced water and decrease our dependency on fresh water. So with that, uh, Commissioner Messner and Director Dalton, I thank you for the time and opportunity to, to provide this brief expose. And, and uh, I'm, I'm happy and thrilled to be involved uh, with the consortium uh, for the purposes uh, that we're here. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, good presentation. Really appreciate uh, the information provided and the uh, um, perspective uh, that you that you bring to the consortium. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, consortium members, do you folks have questions for Clay on his presentation? Thoughts, Tessa? 
Yeah, Tessa Sorensen. Clay, I had a really quick question. Um, that was a great presentation. I, I loved it. Um, you you mentioned the in the um, Niobrara in the DJ Basin uh, how quickly the water production actually drops off over the time, life of the well. Is do you know if there is any change in the mineral content of the water over time? Uh, thank you, Tessa, for that for that question. And, and the, the answer to that is is yes. We we did see a change in uh, water quality as a function of mineral content, um, as a function of time. As you might imagine, um, even in in this era of 2019, there were um, uh, you know, clay uh, protection uh, additives uh, to avoid the clay swelling, which in part uh, increased, you know, potassium and, and chloride levels um, that are artificial to the produced water profile by itself. And, and as we saw those, those uh, water profiles drop off over time, you'd see um, a, a, a drop in potassium chloride uh, concentrations, for instance, and, and, a, and a more traditional uh, balance of, of calcium and magnesium uh, salts associated with the uh, natural occurring conate uh, formation water in the Niagara. So it gets roughly a little bit cleaner as time goes on? It gets a little bit cleaner with respect to the certainly the, the frac fluid chemistry additives that were there and and simply reflects the, the conate water. It, as, you, as you know, the the, the Nibrera is essentially in that 30 to 40,000 milligrams per liter um, TDS concentration, and it's dominated by calcium and magnesium salts and, uh, and sulfates. And so uh, that stabilizes over time for sure. And, and the thing that was notable to me about it all is that it, it, it's a relatively uh, finite process, relatively quick drop off, uh, as you can see from the, the water production um, the type curves that were there. So. Uh, and before I see the floor on, on this question, Clay, can you, just for the benefit of our audience and some of our members, um, describe what the word conate water actually means? Great question. Uh, I, I guess you can find different definitions for it, but but the, the, the vernacular in the oil and gas industry is the naturally occurring formation water uh, associated with the, uh, the fluids within a particular formation. Uh, they are... Uh, in, they were cross. They were they were naturally occurring uh, waters from the original depositional environments. Many of them were uh, uh, seas that that flooded the surface and um, and receded multiple times as the depositional environments for hydrocarbon reservoirs were laid down. But they're the point being that they were naturally occurring and and have been coexistent with the hydrocarbon that's uh, being produced from the formation. Um, uh, as a, you know, sister component, if you will. Thanks, Clay. Barbara? Yeah, quick question, Clay. That very dramatic drop-off in volume produced, can you comment on whether you recover an equivalent volume from the a completion process itself or more? And if so, over a year, what percentage of what was injected is actually recovered? Excellent question, Barbara. And um, the, the, the short answer is, in most uh, natural, uh, in most formations in natural natural gas and hydrocarbon production, the all of the fluids that are injected during the completion processes are are not recovered. And depending on the formation, they there are different percentages that that uh, are reported that are produced uh, in, in the life of that well. Uh, I would suggest that in, in most uh, what we call low permeable or tight formations, a, a higher percentage of the water uh, is produced back somewhere in the range of, I've seen data as high as 60%. Um, more commonly, it's in the range of 30 to 40% from my experience. Um, so there's definitely a, a volume of water that is not recovered uh, that was injected, but uh, due to even to Tessa's original question about the water quality and concentration over time, you you do see that um, 
the, the water constituency change to reflect the, the naturally occurring formation waters. Um, and they continue to be produced uh, for some period of time. And, and some are, in some formations, uh, they, they have a significant uh, production life uh, because they are water drive uh, reservoirs. And so they continue at relatively high levels. In the Niobrara here in the DJ Basin, uh, that's not the case. They tend to drop off and become asymptotic, you know, around a few barrels of water a day um, uh, over the course of the, the life of the well. Thanks a lot, Clay. Well, thanks, Clay, uh, for presenting super good information and uh, um, uh, appreciate that we have you on the consortium. Thank you, John. Um, so next up, and I'm just going to ask folks to grab their lunches as we go here. So, you know, you can jump off screen, grab your lunches, do what you want. I'm, we're not going to take a break. Um, so that we can try to get through our presentations here. So next up, we have Dr. Clowell Danforth. Um, and I'm trying to find my agenda. And she's gonna talk about the a method to identify and prioritize produced water chemicals for research. So welcome, Clowell. Thanks for presenting today. Uh, we can't hear you. How about now? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. And, and can you see my slides and not my notes? Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to hide all of you. So if something goes sideways, um, I, I can hear you. <laughs> I'll just squeak. Um, all right. Let me get my notes here. So, um, Today is definitely one of those days that I really wish we were in person, but I wanted to thank you all for showing up and doing the work and staying engaged. It's really impressive. Um, I'm going to try to keep this relatively short. I want to leave time for questions and to make sure that Dr. Rosenblum gets plenty of time. I think his work um, is pretty relevant to what we're trying to do here in Colorado, which is to build the science around produced water chemicals and how to effectively treat for the removal of constituents concerned. So my name is Cloel Danforth. I am a senior scientist at the Health Effects Institute in the Energy Program. Um, today, I'm gonna to be speaking about work that I did while I was at the Environmental Defense Fund. And what's exciting about this work is that it's underpinning some of the toxicity and risk framework development that is being built by the New Mexico Produce Water Consortium. And EDF continues to leverage it to understand how produce water quality overlaps with our current regulatory structures under the Clean Water Act and then also thinking forward to land-based disposal practices. Um, and I will say that I am gonna be speaking sort of on a national level. Um, if that's the nature of this research, just to give a, a little, it's not necessarily, it does apply to Colorado, but it's, it's definitely a broader uh, look at produced water. So as we're all aware, <laughs> produced water is the largest waste stream associated with oil and gas development. Um, and it can have many different types of chemicals that are either geogenic, are added to the well, or the reactants of those two things. Um, and the chemicals that come back are variable and can change depending on the formation that is being developed, the age of the well, how it's being developed and maintained, and the chemicals used throughout the process of, you know, from stimulation through maintenance, um, so throughout the whole life of the well. So this water is hazardous, it's toxic, it can be very salty. Nationally, again, this can be somewhere between five to 10 times saltier than seawater. That's not necessarily the case in Colorado, um, but it can also be radioactive. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot going on here. Um, and there are a lot of analytical challenges caused by matrix interference, meaning the very nature of produced water can create challenges for the analytical tools that we have to characterize water. So um, if we have analytical tools that are developed for regulatory purposes. So something that a permit writer might assign to a permit. Um, they were certainly designed for surface or groundwater um, and may, may not be super effective in produced water, meaning that produced water has sort of been undercharacterized or mischaracterized. And I should also note that there's not a lot of regulatory driver to know what is in this produced water because it's, you know, 90 to 95% of this is disposed of through deep well injection. Um, or used within the field for enhanced oil recovery or subsequent fracking. So nationally, only a small amount uh, is discharged to the environment intentionally, so one to 5%. Um, so the risk 
profile of sort of, you know, if you're talking about deep well injection, you're thinking about spills and leaks at the surface. If you're talking about intentionally discharging to the environment, you know, we have to start considering more about what do we know about the chemical characteristics of produced water and those potential hazards. And if we start thinking about moving this produced water more, um, you know, from, from one side of the state to the other, think about, you know, increasing infield use, like spills and leaks might also become a consideration. So we just have to think about, you know, how much do we need to know about what's in produced water? So I'm going to focus on one facet of my work um, from my time at the Environmental Defense Fund, which we published back in 2020. Um, and this is this is an open source journal, so you can download this and read this. Um, so basically, we recognized pretty early on that there wasn't a whole lot out there in the literature describing what produced water is. And I really wanted to understand what kinds of generaliz generalizations could be made about produced water, um, or if there's even enough data to start making those generalizations. Um, and this is all important because, you know, if, again, thinking towards out of field reuse, not this in field recycling. Um, you know, knowing what is in the produced water will impact how we design robust and resilient treatment systems or what kind of tools we need to assess the efficacy of those treatments, um, what is potentially released to the environment and how to measure any potential exposure to those chemicals. So I worked with some folks at Texas A&M <clears throat> and another nonprofit to review the literature and aggregate any studies on produced water, which we then used to develop a database. And that database is also uh, published along with this paper. Um, <clears throat> and it's since been incorporated into EPA's comp talks, which is that little um, list at the bottom. Um, so once we pulled out all these data, um, we basically just dumped them into a spreadsheet and then you can crosswalk them to any other list of chemicals. So we, we looked at standard analyzed, uh, standard, analyzed standard methods for approved for use by EPA to analyze uh, these chemicals um, in the environment, list of chemicals developed by various regulatory authorities. And the thinking was, if it's on a list, a uh, regulatory list, then we know something about the, the chemicals, either you know, it's, it's hazard or, you know, what kind of tools we can use to look for it. And then we also looked at sort of bigger toxicity databases. The way that we developed this, um, we basically, we conducted a literature review using systematic review methods, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a systematized way to review the literature. Um, basically, we looked for anything that was peer reviewed or gray um, that reported chemical characterization of the wastewater. So not spills and leaks, not environmental impacts, but any water that was surfaced, if that was sampled and analyzed for, we, we pulled that in. Um, from conventional or unconventional uh, oil and gas production onshore in North America. So for that first, first round for that paper that was developed or published in 2020, we looked at nearly 16,000 papers. <laughs> we had to cast a pretty wide net and we winnowed that down to 130. Um, since then, uh, actually with the help with, uh, from uh, Dr. Ryan's grad student, we have updated that. So this literature is through 2019. Um, <clears throat> so now we have 181 studies that have been pulled into this database. Um, <clears throat> currently, there are 2,500 produced water samples that are included in this database, which amount to about 37,000 <laughs> chemical in bulk water quality analytes. Um, these are things that were looked for, uh, not necessarily detected, but of chemicals that were detected and had a CAS number, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit more, we identified uh, 1,350 different uh, unique chemicals that were looked for and detected in produced water nationally. Um, we also included some bulk water quality parameters. So these are things like oil and grease, um, alkalinity, you know, things that are commonly measured to just get sort of a general characteristic of, of, of water quality. And I will say, you know, this, this literature and information is growing. So if anybody wants to pick up the mantle and redo a literature review, this, this, this database definitely could use an update. Um, so as I said, once we pulled all of those, those chemicals and their cast numbers into a spreadsheet, we could crosswalk them to a bunch of things. So one of the, the things that's actually not on this slide, but I wanna to touch on, um, if you are a permit writer and you want to uh, set lists and limits, you're, you're, there's a, you know, a certain list of standard analytical methods that you can reach for. You can use non-standard methods. 
a little harder to include in a permit. But of these 1350, I, I recognize that these are the, the first database numbers, but the the um, the pattern sort of holds true of the the number of chemicals that we have identified as as in as being detected in produced water. Only about a quarter of them have standard analytical methods. So I think the current number is 322. Um, if you start looking at toxicity databases, um, you know, and toxicity information and data isn't all, you know, high quality. <laughs> So there's, uh, you know, it takes a really long time to develop these health-based, uh, sorry, these risk-based health guidance values um, that are that are used for like cleanup standards. Um, so of of the 1,300 chemicals, only about 15% of them have the type of toxicity information that you would need need to be able to do a risk assessment. Um, there's other data out there, and it can be anything from you know, well-designed uh, chronic studies on mouse models, or somebody just did like a 50% dilution and watched how much algae died once, <laughs> you know, any, so it's a whole range of, of data. Only about half the chemicals on this list have any sort of toxicity data. So by and large, the chemicals that have been reported as being detected in produced water are pretty data poor with respect to what we know about them. Just because they don't have toxicity data doesn't mean that they're toxic. It just means we don't know. <laughs> so there's a lot to be done to prioritize chemicals for further research because it's pretty research intensive. Um, <clears throat> there are some huge limitations with this list of chemicals. This is definitely not a be all end all list. Um, so I, I, I feel I really need to make sure that you guys understand the, the caveats. Um, one problem is that where there have been studies on produced water, they may not have used uh, what could be considered a comprehensive sort of set of tools to characterize it. You know, a major limitation is that you really only find what you're looking for. So a lot of the studies I pulled in only looked at inorganic chemicals, um, and some of them only looked for maybe one or two ions. So they really were just looking for, is there lithium or strontium in this, this water? On the other hand, where researchers employed these non-targeted or exploratory analysis, they found some things that they might not think to look for. So we, uh, there was two papers in the database that found PFAS. Um, and these were in two very different basins. One was in Eagle Ford in, in Texas, another was in Marcellus. Um, and so this made us look for PFAS reporting in frac focus. And it's been, again, it's been a while since I've looked at this, I think 2019. Um, at that time, about 12 states reported using PFAS in their hydro hydraulic fraction fluid, including Colorado. Um, the New Mexico Produced Water Research Consortium has sort of a tiered list of chemicals to look for. And because of you know, finding produced water in, or PFAS in produced water, PFAS are now on that list um, to look for in, in treated produced water. Um, there was another paper that came out that looked for um, fluorinated or you know PFAS in uh, hydraulic fracturing fluids. Uh, physicians for Social Responsibility found that that more than 1,200 wells included some kind of fluorinated surfactant. So you know we we do see stuff that is put down full coming back, but only if we know to look for it. Um, if you compare my list, my 1,300 chem chemicals to frac focus, and again this is an old frac focus list, only about 90 of those chemicals came back as reported as what was going downhole. So it's, there's some disconnect. And I think Terry, you know, touched on this well, like we don't get back everything goes, goes down full necessarily. And we certainly don't get it back in the same form that it went down, um, but sometimes we do. And it, it helps sort of uh, create predictive, um, you know, we kind of know what to look for better if we know what's going down. So there's, again, there's a lot going on here. Um, Another major limitation of this database is that we only included numbers or chemicals with CAS numbers. So even though there's a lot of good work out there that characterize chemicals that don't have CAS numbers, which are the um, chemical abstract service registry number, it's just a unique identifying um, ID for a chemical. So you know, chemicals have like a billion different names. So you wanna be able to know what you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> so some of the things that we know that are in produced water um, are these, you know, there's undefined mixtures or these long chain isomers. These are chemicals that are known to be used in production and maintenance to do things like assist in fluid recovery or as corrosion inhibitors. These are found over and over again in produced water. Um, they're not in this list. Um, so 
finally, even when researchers use these non-targeted exploratory analysis and where they can identify chemicals with or without cast numbers, we can still learn something about produced water, even if we don't necessarily know what those chemicals are. Um, <clears throat> Luke et al., which, in, and importantly, his paper was done in Marcellus. So, you know, we'd have to kind of think about, does this apply in Colorado? Um, <clears throat> they did a temporal characterization of produced water over three months and found that um, the organic compounds um, halogenated over time. So this is important. You may have heard of disinfection byproducts. So basically halogen compounds, iodine, bromine, and chloride, if you combine them with organic, they create uh, organic compounds, they create toxic compounds. So we don't know what they are, <laughs> but we know that they could be problematic. So there's, again, there's just a lot going on. And finally, illustrate one last reason why we don't necessarily have the data we need to comprehensively describe produced water granularly, granularly or by geographic region is that a lot, most of the samples that are in this database came from the Marcellus region. Um, and that's just not <laughs> the world that we're living in or necessarily where produced water is generated across the United States. Um, luckily, we have a number, you know, 13% of the, of the samples that are in this uh, database are from Colorado. Um, but again, you know, I, I think this sort of really highlights that we need to do uh, work um, at a geographic region, you're really thinking through what is in the water that we're thinking about reusing, particularly as we think about, you know, using it outside of the oil field. So I think our work provides really useful insights, um, but it definitely doesn't eliminate concern from the broader list of chemicals. Um, I, I, I have also done work comparing this list to uh, sort of, you know, drinking water standards or um, surface water standards. And in Colorado, so of the 300 chemicals within my list that have standard analytical methods, I think 78 of them are covered by, um, are found on the surface water quality standards of, of Colorado. So, uh, the, you know, this, this work really speaks to, I think, our last deliverable, <laughs> thinking about what we need to, to do to understand if we want to use this outside of the oil field. And I think it's just really important that we look beyond sort of our current list and tools. This water is, is different than what we've, you know, tried to reuse. And it's really important to understand, you know, the, the source water as we're thinking about reusing it um, outside of the oil field. So I'm going to stop there um, and I'm going to hopefully see your faces again. <laughs> okay, now I can see you guys again. Um, thanks, Chloe. That was super, um, super informative. Always appreciate the presentations that you give and the perspective that you bring. And so uh, thanks for um, sharing that information with us today. Uh, consortium members, questions for uh, Dr. Danforth. Um, Barbara. No question, but just thank you very much for the uh, informative presentation. It just underscores uh, the magnitude of what we don't know and that uh, the humility that we have to bring to our jobs uh, as members of the consortium in talking about regulation and potential use outside of the oil field really needs to be grounded in that humility. So thank you. I, I do want to note that, you know, this is untreated produced water, and I don't think that anybody on this call would think about using untreated produced water for anything. But, you know, we need to know what's in it before we treat it. We need to know if those treatment uh, methods are efficacious. And, you know, how do we, how do we know, right? It's the unknown unknowns. And it's, and it, produced water with this, with associated with oil and gas isn't necessarily in unique um, wastewater or a complex wastewater. Um, but we are a little bit behind the ball because we haven't needed to necessarily understand what's in it. Um, and we have an opportunity to, you know, get the science right before sort of, you know, putting it out into the environment. Yeah. And it's that lead with the science that's so important here. So thank you. Harmony. I also want to say a really big thank you, Cloel. I um, have got to interface with you in 
doing research on produced water. And just, I think you come with so much experience, background and passion and how much I appreciate you in this presentation. And I also sent another presentation that EDF put together a webinar about produced water to hope for anybody else um, who wants that resource as well. So thank you to Cloel. Um, and then also, just from my background in oil and gas and working in risk management, the more you handle a material, the more spills um, you will have. That's just how it looks. And I think that's really important when we think about the actual on the field, real world logistics of this. We think about the trucking of this um, and all of the impacts cumulatively. Um, my next question that jumped to the top of my head was, do we need legislation trying to put through through the end of this year, possibly, to try to get funding to do a study for produced water in the state of Colorado? Is this a question I'll for me? On that in a, in, a, in a minute. Okay, perfect, perfect. And then since I still, um, I was going to say, I'm like, I helped draft this bill to create this. I could help draft that too. I definitely, yeah. Uh, and then my next, yeah, well, if we're going to talk on that one. Um, and then for the data set that you just had up there where it talks about oil and gas wastewater, wasn't for the people from the industry, was 2020 a slowdown in oil and gas production or was that considered something that was like a necessary thing? Because are those numbers significantly lower? I imagine that those lowers, lowers are low compared to today for a number of reasons. But I was just wondering if anyone on this call could give clarification to that. Are you are you talking about the produced water volumes by state? The last slide that you just had yeah. up. So those numbers. So the citation is Vale 2020, um, and I I think that the latest one is actually all consulting from 2021. Those data lag by two years um, because it's just a huge effort to to pull all of those data together. Um, I can I can put that resource in the the chat. It's a GWPC Groundwater Protection Council does this Herculean effort every year to just pull these numbers together. And there's a you know there's big caveats in there too in terms of you know each state reports differently. Um, or not at know. all. <laughs> yeah and there's there's some strange things in there like um like I know that Wyoming has some you know, like 400 NIPTES permits for surface water discharge of, of, of produced water. And these are from a variety of different wells, including coal bed methane. And um, they have reported that they don't have any surface discharge. So it's, it's, it's you know, for, for certain years. So it's a little, the, the, it's all to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but but that's, the, that's the best estimation we have. And it's, you know, they, they do their best to pull together every year. And so you can see sort of annually how that changes. But yeah, I would also be interested to hear how <laughs> industry um, their sense for for produce water development over over time. Um, Clay, yeah, it, uh, like Terry, in an effort to answer uh, Harmony's question, uh, I I can't provide any quantified uh, data, but I can attest to the fact that during the COVID pandemic, there were definite. Uh, interruptions in uh, well construction and uh, work over procedures that would could have should have uh, translated into uh, lower volumes of, of produced water during those years. No question about it. John? Yes, in your uh, study, do you see a marketable difference between the handling of naturally occurring formation water related to production only, particularly CBM? versus flow back and something that is completion related. James actually can speak to this particular for Niobrara. Um, there are, you know, I'm thinking about your one study, James, from four, 405 days post-production. You are seeing some of these chemicals come back um, that, you know, are definitely additives. Um, and they're probably, I'm guessing from maintenance. Uh, Colvin methane is, a, is, as you know, is a very different animal. It is much, much lower TDS. Um, and I'm, I'm digging through some deep recesses of my brain, thinking about CBM. You, you, you do have to worry about a different sort of tranche of chemicals. PAHs come to mind, these polyaromatic hydrocarbons um, that are associated with coal um, are in produced water that are of concern. Um, but because CBM water is so much less saline, you know, we can apply some of these more traditional 
um, water treatment and characterization methods. That said, I would still want to do some of these higher resolution exploratory analyses on a pilot scale, just to sort of confirm that we can treat and remove these, these you know, pHs are known, the human carcinogens, right? Like we wanna make sure that they're out. And are we looking for them in freeze water um, if we're just sort of looking at a, a normal list of, of chemicals or a NIPTES permit? I, I appreciate your work. Uh, we'd certainly be interested in a uh, innovative uh, use of produced water pilot study, because um, I do believe CBM is different. Um, and this uh, this basin down in Colorado is um, unique in a couple of ways, but not completions related activity or flowback related where we're injecting chemicals down. It's just the handling of naturally occurring formation water related strictly to production. Um, and that's, uh, I, I applaud your efforts. Thank you. I will say thank you. Um, in New Mexico, the Produce Water Research Consortium is really focusing on, and I think this came up at some point in today's conversation, fit for purpose treatment and reuse. So you know, in end point, you know, depending on who we think is, or what we think is gonna be exposed, you know, we need to have different considerations for livestock watering, um, you know, is it bioaccumulative and are we going to be eating them? <laughs> like, or is it going to, you know, PFAS end up in cow milk? So, you know, we have to, we have to think about that if we're going to be feeding animals or, you know, if you're doing rangelands restoration, are they, are they being sequestered into the plants? Are they, you know, moving far range? So point is the conversation shifts when you start thinking about different reuses, um, you know, depending on the source water and, and, and endpoint treatments. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Cloel, for <clears throat> for being here and sharing your your expertise and your knowledge. Um, uh, I I learned something. Well, I learn a lot from you every time you present, and hope that we can continue to um, get information from you as we continue down the process. So, thank you. Um, so, next up is Dr. James Rosenblum, um, and he is going to talk about water quality of produced water. So I'm gonna kick it over to you, James. Cool. Uh, end of the day, keeping everybody from the Friday and a weekend. Um, so I'm gonna fly through a ton of data um, and I'm, I'm just gonna dive right in. And I think some of the things that Cloel's talking and Clo I've followed Cloel in numerous talks and I think our talks kind of go well together in terms of her talking about the unknowns and things that we don't know. And then I kind of come in with the state of the research that we're doing. And specifically, I'll talk about a, a, a theoretical reuse study or a study we did at the lab scale, pilot scale about treating DJ basin water to a, a theoretical discharge, just what, what's the water quality we can achieve by putting together a treatment train. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, and just to kind of shout out to the Colorado Center of West at, at Mines, where I'm at, Zahi and I started six plus years ago, just a large 10,000 square foot R&D lab that was donated by NGL Energy Partners and funded by Zoma Foundation. And this is where this research took place. We were on lab, very large kind of pilot demonstration scale facility in Northeast Denver. We do a variety of research there, emerging contaminants, a lot of PFAS related work, direct potable reuse. Zahi has a large 40 foot trailer that uh, is at municipalities around the state doing mobile uh, direct potable reuse research water energy nexus uh, related research, and then a lot of produced water treatment and reuse. And I just want to highlight it. We just got a paper Zahi and I published. Uh, it went public, I think about a week ago or live on a, a performance evaluation of a high salinity produced water treatment train, um, looking at chemical analysis and aerial hydrocarbon activation. And so what I'll talk about today is almost this paper summarizes this for a Permian basin or a very high salinity produced water. Um, and do want to highlight Patricia, this was a great collaboration between EPA and School of Mines, um, doing a, a variety of different analyses and uh, toxicological analysis. Uh, just quickly, again, I, I know there's been more recent talks were more about infield reuse. I'll focus really on the re potential reuse outside of, oil, uh, of the oil field and really trying to research and evaluate analytical and toxicological methods employed during produced water treatment. And just want to kind of highlight that here. Again, this is for reuse outside the theoretical reuse outside the oil field. 
So uh, Zahi and I were very fortunate to receive a grant from the Department of Energy through the National Energy Technology Laboratory, uh, along with three partners, University of Pittsburgh and the University of North Dakota, to treat at a pilot demonstration scale a variety of produced waters that were provided by NGL. Um, and essentially, the, we had funding or a, a fair amount of funding to do the research. And at this point, it was great because we could do these pilots, but we didn't quite have the funding to expand to the analytical level that we wanted to do. And this is where uh, ECMC, uh, Commissioner Mesner, kind of came through with some Martinez Irwin's funds to expand the database that we could build for the state and really for the consortium. So kind of in bold underlined up here, the DOE had provided us funding to do the piloting for labor and to do the suite of analyses, general water quality, TOC, anions, some uh, semi-volatile organics, the BTEX, things of that nature. And we were going to be able to do some high-res mass spec for non-targeted. And uh, again, Commissioner Mesner and ECMC were able to provide uh, funds to do the what we were kind of calling the New Mexico cons uh, Produce Water Consortium. They have a very comprehensive list of over 700 chemicals that have commercial-based methods. And we were able to apply that using those Martinez Urban funds, which was great. And in addition to that, uh, those funds allowed us to incorporate some in vitro bioassay testing that we're doing here at mine. So, and I'll present very quickly on all of this, a lot of data it would take hours to get through, but I'm just going to kind of highlight on uh, some key, some key indicators and PFAS, things of that nature in the bioassays. So just to kind of, kind of figure out the breadth of the scale, um, this is just the analysis that took place at mines for the sample bottles. Here are the coolers that went out for commercial lab analysis. And again, we did this at a pretty sizable scale, which you'll see in a moment. And we did keep totes of the reverse osmosis permeate. You kind of think about this would be the theoretical discharge water that if folks wanted to study, theoretically, Tom, it's borscht at CSU. If you wanted to do a plant study or uptake, you know, we have these totes, at least one tote of 275 gallons stored for somebody if somebody had funds or wanted to uh, pursue that. Um, so here is, and I, I know I'm flying, so I apologize. I want to leave a little time at the end for questions. Here's our back of the, the, the lab in Denver, where we actually brought in 20,000 gallons of produced water. These are frack tanks uh, that are commonly seen at oil and gas sites. We brought them out. You can see they're in containment, one and a half times their volume. Um, and from here, we would do some pretreatment here, coagulation, iron and softening, and uh, pre-filtration. And we would push this water then into our lab. Um, this is facilities and uh, small pilots we have in the lab that we kind of put together to make what we call a treatment train. And you'll hear me say that a lot. And think about like a train. You have an engine, multiple cars, and a caboose. And in this case, the engines, the reverse osmosis, which we'll get to. And then there's all these other cars that make the water ideally clean enough to not follow a reverse osmosis membrane. And so what you're looking at here on the left, this was a, a UF or ultrafiltration membrane. Uh, we followed that up with media absorption, and then that fed into our reverse osmosis pilot. This is a shout out to Noah, grad student, helped a lot with this pilot building and, and ap actually operation. And this was a 24-hour day operation for about five days as we treated the 20,000 gallons. Um, here's just a, a visual of kind of the raw water that came into uh, those produced water tanks those frack tanks, and then kind of through each treatment process, you can see it get cleaner, clearer and clearer again. As you're in the RO feed, this water looks very clear. There's still 30,000 milligrams per liter of salt, along with the, a variety of organic and inorganic constituents that would be of concern. And this is where the desalination stuff is really critical, and you'll see this in the data. Um, and just as kind of a side note for this DOE project, uh, this is actually all of the reject or the concentrate, we, we could call it. So what permeates through the membranes is high quality water, low, low salts, low organics. The reject, which is now concentrated salt, we actually trucked this up to North Dakota to be further concentrated. And this is just an image of how much water we were able to collect to use for that study. So again, I apologize. I'm going to go quickly here just to get through it all. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But so this is the commercial lab analysis for targeted inorganic and organic chemicals. And so the raw water, um, this is again, commercial lab data, was the TDS was around 22,000 milligrams per liter. Again, this is commercial lab data. Um, they, based on their dilutions, they had the chloride higher than that. It's a little odd. Um, but after the UF feed, TDS should go, UF does not remove total dissolved solids, shouldn't go down at all. 
Um, and then I should just note here in the yellow is calcium. So this is a scaling ion that we are concerned about and just some high level or inorganics in this water. And so as you move, move through, you can just kind of follow the blue bar. That's the total dissolved solids, you know, plus or minus, you know, thousand milligrams per liter here, which is pretty sick, pretty high actually. Um, but that none of these pre-treatment steps remove these, this TDS, this total dissolved solids or salinity or what you might want to call it. And these major inorganic ions until you really get to uh, the first pass of the reverse osmosis. In this case, we pushed it out through a very tight RO membrane at a high pressure, about 900 PSI. And then we did a second pass just to remove the TDS even further. And so essentially we took our raw produced DJ basin water from roughly 20,000 milligrams per liter through our first pass was about 700 milligrams per liter. And after a second pass through RO, uh, we achieved 120 milligrams per liter of just total dissolved solids. Uh, in addition to that, we also did NORM through the commercial labs. And here are just four of the higher level naturally occurring radio uh, radionuclides in the water. And I should note, you know, relative to other oil and gas basins, we do have pretty low uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials in our water. Um, you know, some of these obviously radium here is about eight picocuries per liter, uh, through the UF, you know, these things can be sticky and will stick to particles. And so you, you're not, we're not seeing it. I very, we are seeing removal through the pretreatment. Um, and then even in the RO feed at this point, only potassium 40 is there. And, and through the RO permeate, we are seeing non-detect levels of the, the natural current radioactive materials that we, that we were looking at, which is a commercial uh, method done at a state hygienic lab. Um, from there, I'm showing you here the total organic carbon and the total nitrogen levels. So the POC or total organic carbon in the water is roughly 82 milligrams per liter. There was substantial remover from the raw water to the feed of our UF, our kind of ultrafiltration membrane. Um, from there, uh, it was removed a little bit more by absorption. And then the bulk of that organic content or the total organic carbon was rejected by the first pass in the RO membrane. And as you can see, it's pretty insignificant between the first and second pass. So whatever passed through the first time made it through uh, when it went through the membrane a second time. And so this is a, a substantial removal of total organic carbon, but still understanding what this 1.7 milligrams per liter is very critical to understand the, the potential uses of this water. And then here is Total nitrogen, we actually do add a bit of nitrogen through the pretreatment, so you'd actually see it go up, and then it is rejected by the IRO membrane. Um, here are just hydrocarbon indicators, and again, I apologize as I'm going so fast here, but want to cover as much data as I can so everybody can see what we're doing at, at this level of research. So this is just kind of breaking down, you know, the gasoline range organics. That's from two hydrocarbons, so methane's one, from two all the way up to 10, or what we call GRO followed by benzene, naphthalene, and phenanthrene. These are just different aryl hydrocarbon rings. And so uh, the GRO, or gasoline range organics, was very high in the raw water and reduced several orders of magnitude through um, the pretreatment. And for some odd reason, it is concentrated through the RO. But uh, again, I can't really speak to this level and what limits would be, but in terms of benzene, naphthalene, and phenanthrene, uh, they are removed through the pretreatment. So they, they don't even make it after through absorption. So they are absorbed um, in our pretreatment and do not even make it to the, the membrane itself. And as you can see, are non-detect uh, following um, the RO and the RO permeate. And this over here, the RO, this is represents RO concentrate. So that is what is rejected from the membrane. Onto what we call, I call the Danforth 40. This is just, there's 40 compounds that that are from Cloel's. I'm sure you're smiling there, Cloel. Uh, 40 compounds that she says are high priority that could be persistent if they did reach the environment. Here are the ones that were detected or we did find at least in the raw water um, through our treatment train. And so this is just a highlight. I should note, note that if you see this 8270E SIM versus 8270E, these here at the bottom represent true standard methods. The SIM represents a non-targeted approach where the software just picks up a peak that looks or fragments similar to these compounds. So many of these things we actually did have a standard method for and they weren't detected, but I did want to include them because they were found in the SIM approach. And just please note that the units here in SIM, you're nanograms per liter. So thousand times lower than the micrograms per liter here. 
Um, and we do see things do pass through all the way to the RO membrane. Specifically, I want to just call out toluene here, very high levels of it in the raw, over a milligram per liter in the raw water. Free treatment substantially removes at several orders of magnitude um, as it is removed to even lower levels after absorption, but somehow is concentrated in the water to higher levels. And, and again, I, I, there's something that we haven't talked about, and it is the complexity of produced water and how it can kind of, I don't want to say wreak havoc, but be challenging for analytical methods due to salts being ions and how we measure most of these things is the formation of an ion. And so we will see things appear in our permeate now that we have this really low salinity environment, relatively clean water for this, the instrument to see, and things will appear that you didn't see previously. So the fact that toluene is here at a very low level and then higher in the RO is, is odd, but this isn't uncommon for us to see through a produced water treatment train. Um, a, a big topic of conversation is often PFAS. And so here is the, again, this is a single sample, and we've looked at dozens of DJ and other produced waters. We infrequently at this point see PFAS in the raw water, um, but we did see in the raw water PFBA. And again, this notion of things not being in raw samples and then appearing in later treatments. This is a per perfect example. We now see it in the UF feed, PFBA, PFPEA, PFBS, and PFHXA. Uh, the two most toxic are PFOA and PFOS. We, they were not detected at any point during our treatment train. Um, and the only things that made it anywhere past our pretreatment were in the RO concentrate, and that was PFHXA at 0.27 nanograms per liter and 6,2 FTS, which is a precursor PFAS compound. But again, very few or very low levels were found in the raw water at any part in pretreatment, and everything was non-detect after our absorption step, as well as in the RO permeate. Um, so that is just covering, again, 700 chemicals. I covered maybe 60 of them or 70 of them of the commercial lab data. Um, and this will be given to the consortium. This is something the state paid for, and all of this data will be given over for all of us to look at, evaluate, and try to just have a, a, a starting point of what does raw, raw in this case, DJ Basin, so it doesn't represent all the basins in Colorado, but what does raw DJ base and produce water look like in terms of this list of 700 chemicals plus all the way through a treatment train that could potentially be used here if folks wanted to try to, you know, to some level of discharge or reuse outside of the oil field. Um, so that's the commercial targeted side. I'm going to now step into the non-targeted analysis, which is going to get more complex. So I do apologize, but in this realm of Cloel talking about the unknown unknowns, these are the tools and techniques we use to identify these unknowns. And so I just want everybody to be aware that there are a lot of unknowns, but we are looking for them. It's not an easy task and it takes time and effort, but you know, we, we do know how to do this and just take time and effort. So on the left here is a gas chromatograph, that's their high resolution mass spec, actually at CU Boulder that we used in this case uh, to analyze these samples. Um, and so from here, uh, again, many of you have probably never seen this. And so I'm just going to highlight a couple things. This is an actual total ion chromatogram, or we call it tick. These are the peaks that we see in this very top one in kind of, I guess it would be a darker red, um, is the raw water. And so you can see there are a lot of peaks and this UNK represents an unknown chemical. So many of these things uh, we are looking for in our standard method. In this case, it was US EPA 8270, semi-volatile analysis. So we know what many of these things are identified, but you can actually see the largest peaks in this chromatogram are unknown chemicals that aren't picked up in that standard method. Right, so that is kind of driving Cloel's point is, hey, there's things in there we're not looking for. Um, however, as we go through a treatment train, we do see these things being removed. And so this IS represents the internal standards, which are deuterated chemicals that we have in our mixture. Um, these become the highest ions in our chromatogram as we move through. And I, I did put some, uh, you know, structures here so people, if they cared, could see that. Um, and I'm just going to call on a, a couple of these unknowns and what happens through the treatment terrain. So this is a chemical uh, one dodecanamine. 
Um, and this is the largest peak in the chromatogram. Here is its structure that we've identified using an unknown technique or a non-targeted technique. Here it is, and this doesn't represent concentration, this represents peak areas. So this is the area under the curve, AOC, um, and it's at very high level in the raw water. It is removed substantially during our first pretreatment step, coagulation, as it's fed into the RUF. It is at a uh, pretty similar level or some, some reason a higher level in the absorption step, but following absorption, this chemical is not detect for our method. So we don't see it in the feed that goes into the RO in, or in either the permeates. So this is, again, it's important to know what's in the raw water, but if you're thinking about putting this water into the environment or some other space, you know, looking through a treatment train and seeing, hey, okay, we see it in the raw water. It's the highest chemical in, in uh, or in this case, in the chromatogram, but it is removed through treatment and looking for these things and not using just standard methods. Um, on the non-targeted GC, uh, oh, uh, this should say LCMS, um, we did uh, putatively or potentially identify four compounds. Uh, and this is much more difficult on the LCMS side and I do just want to focus on one of them, that's dimethylbenzylamine that we saw. And this compound um, is here on the, where is it? Right here. It is this chemical here, this, this nitrogenous um, benzene ring here. Um, we see it in the raw sample. It is in the UF feed. And you can't clearly see this, but every chromatogram after that, so in the RO feed, permeate and concentrate, they are essentially non-detect for the method we're using. And here's the structure. And this is much more difficult in the space of the LCMS world where you, this is the data that you have for high resolution mass spec and you have to build back these structures um, and then shoot a standard to confirm that's what it is. Lastly uh, is the toxicity testing that we're doing. Um, and that is in vitro bioassay using an aryl hydrocarbon receptor. These, the pyrene just represents what a, a pH or aryl hydrocarbon might look like. And we base all of these methods kind of uh, as an equivalency test to uh, 2378 TCDD, uh, a highly toxic uh, dioxin chemical. And in this case, we grow up a cell suspension. We then expose those cells to our extracted samples. So think about the raw water or the permeate. And then we let them basically soak in that water, be exposed to that sample for a period of time. Um, and then we uh, we are able to basically add in a luciferase uh, promoter and quantify the the upregulation of a aryl hydrocarbon gene and and look at this through the treatment train. So on the left here in this kind of purple color is our TC, TCDD spike. So we want to confirm that we're able to, you know, that we did not kill the cells themselves and that we do see a turning on of the, the aryl hydrocarbon gene. In the DJB raw sample, again, this is raw produced water. I don't think anybody would want to put raw produced water in, in the environment or do anything outside of the oil field with this raw water, at least I would hope not, um, just like we don't want to do that with raw municipal waste, uh, municipal sludge. But the gene is turned on nearly 70 times that of our baseline or our blank sample. So there are a significant amount of aero hydrocarbons in this raw water. And again, we went through them in the uh, data that I showed here with uh, naphthalene and phenanthrene through after uh, Ultra filtration, we do see still there are some, you know, 10x the turning on of the aryl hydrocarbon gene. Uh, but when we go through absorption and go to feed this water into the reverse osmosis, we can essentially see we're at or below that of our blank. And blank is ultra pure HPLC grade water that we then do the same extraction process with and, and run with the cells. So you know, through our pretreatment, even before it reaches the RO membrane. At this point, we're at the background level of our assay, which is one or less than one nanogram per liter of TCDD. Um, and in the R permeates even lower. So from a, again, this is a non-targeted approach to look at aryl hydrocarbons. Hey, we have the targeted methods to look to quantify. We have the non-targeted GC methods to then go and look even further into the data. And now we're actually exposing a human cell 
that has a very specific gene within it to evaluate is there some true unknown unknown that can elicit the same sort of response. And so, as you can see, clearly that exists in the raw water. We have that support with the chemical data, same with the UF feed. But as you move through the treatment train, those, it, those um, chemicals are removed through treatment and into our, our upper hand. And this just from a reference perspective, from one sample of wastewater treatment effluent, we see at about a one and a half fold and in wastewater treatment effluent, that's influent versus effluent, very similar to our blank. So just to get, provide some perspective here on other waters, um, and we, we do try to do that because it is kind of hard to evaluate this at times when you're just looking at it through your sole treatment train. And with that, that is it. Just want to acknowledge my colleagues, definitely my partner in crime here, Zahi Kath at the, the West Center, Claire Wadler, who is a postmaster student and did a lot of the the GC work, Elise Wright, who helped with the, or essentially performed the toxicity testing, my team at PWR, and then obviously funders, you know, specifically CMNC and uh, Martita Zerwan, Commissioner Mesner, and as well as the DOE. And so I, I'm actually going to leave my slides up if folks want to, when they have questions, they want me to go back to it, um, if that's okay. And uh, if not, I can just close it out. No, you can leave them up. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. Um, that's complicated. So I've got a ton of questions, but I'm going to ask you <laughs> offline and then we can uh, bring it back um, to and, the consortium. But, um, but and John, uh, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. Um, no, I, I, th I think that there's probably a ton of questions about this. And, you know, again, I apologize for the shortness of the time. Um, I do want to take as many questions as we possibly uh, can here at the end of the meeting. Um, but then if folks have additional questions, um, certainly send them to Director Dalton, um, <clears throat> who will forward them on to you in order to be able to uh, answer them offline and then present them to the consortium as a whole. Or hold on to your questions until the next meeting. And I'm also happy to set up a specific time to do question and answers from previous discussions at the following meeting, if that uh, is uh, something that folks are interested in as well. But um, Mike, why don't you start with your question? Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, James, thanks a lot. That's a lot of really, really interesting, useful information. Um, one question I had is I understand that you're doing this in the lab. I'm curious about the potential for scaling this up and, and doing it at a commercial level. And I'm wondering, for example, you know, what, what, is, what's, if you have numbers, you know, what's the cost per barrel to, to do the treatment train you're talking about, or, you know, what what more work needs to be done or questions need to be answered if someone was thinking about using this at a, at a, at a broader scale? Yeah, on the on this cost side, that's it's hard. I mean, at this point, we're at the pilot demonstration scale. I don't have a cost per barrel. And it'd be nice to do a techno-economic analysis of this treatment train to evaluate that. So I don't have a number for you there. So I apologize on that. Um, and then, you know, if you were to scale up, my, it was second part of your question about what things to look yeah, at. Yeah, just just um, you know, apart from the co I mean, apart from the cost question, are there questions or more research you would want to do before doing this at a commercial scale, or you know, what what would um, what what are you looking at in terms of you know what might, would be necessary if someone wanted to try and do this more broadly? Yeah, I, I think one thing that I've spoke with Zahi Thomas and maybe a little bit with Joe Ryan, uh, the kind of the academic side is plant uptake studies to understand, you know, if there are, you know, we do know there are some chemicals in that RO permeate, what will happen if you are to irrigate with them and what would be the fate of those compounds um, in that sort of scenario. Again, try to do this in a controlled environment to understand uptake into plants. And, and again, in this case, we're doing in vitro bioassays. It'd be nice to do a wet test or whole effluent toxicity and do just a variety of different toxicological approaches that would look at aquatic um, aquatic life, as well as maybe maybe plant-based studies to kind of be maybe the next steps to expand on this, in addition to that techno-economic side to understand the, the real cost of something like this. Thank you. Lowell? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, James. Can you comment a little bit on what happens to the, what we've been calling the hazards um, what, and what we would call the solids and the rejects? In this scenario or in that? Uh, in any, yeah, this one particularly, but, and then maybe more generally. Yeah, so in, in this study, we, you know, the, 
in in the case of solids, we don't really have a true cake or, you know, uh, when Grant Tupper presented, they, they filter press and actually make a cake and there's a solid that you then need to uh, landfill or put into an appropriate landfill or manage in an appropriate way. In this case, we basically generate a slurry or a brine. Um, and so in both cases, those are both managed through U, uh, UIC class two injection wells. So the same way the raw produced water is managed. But if you were to scale this up, you likely would have a cake, again, similar to what Grand Select's doing with their recycle projects. So you would have a cake and then you would have essentially a reject or a brine, both, well, at least the brine would be managed through UIC. Um, and then in this cake, I, case, I would imagine the cake would be managed in a similar way that Select is operating now. Barbara? Yeah, thanks so much for that presentation, James. A couple quick questions. One, what's the percent of the initial volume you get out at the end? And two, how long do the RO filters last with the so pretreatment that you're using? But, yeah, in both. terms of volume that you can put through. So in this case, we recovered about 56%, somewhere between 55 and 60% of the volume is what we were able to recover. Um, we, you could recover more, but there are some challenging scale ions that start to kind of rear their head in specifically this water. Um, so you, you know, maybe you, and again, that was, I don't know if you, if we went back and I had those totes, the idea is we were sending those totes to North Dakota mm -hmm. to see how much water could we truly extract um, from it. And I, I think in total, that was a different technology using membrane distillation. And we got another 50 ish percent. So a total recovery of around 75%, but that energy cost is pretty substantial. Um, so, to, um, so that was the first one was the volume. What was the second one, Barbara? Um, what volume can you put through these RO filters oh. before they need to be changed out? So in this case, you know, we ran for six days straight through uh, two, uh, two and a half inch elements. Um, and we saw no following of the membrane the entire time. And so the, again, that's that's the crux of, in this case, our lower salinity water in Colorado that we're very fortunate to have across the state. Um, Pre-treatment will, will be the key. We can use nanofiltration or reverse osmosis to do the desalination. That's a proven technology off the shelf. It's the fitting of the pre-treatment steps that protect that membrane that'll be key. And so in this case, I, we successfully ran for six days, 24 hours a day, process about 20,000 gallons, and we saw no fouling over those six days, but we did have a pretty robust pretreatment process. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Well, thanks, James, for the presentation, and uh, thanks to all our presenters, Cloel, James, and Clay, and um, great to have that expertise and experience on the consortium, the perspectives that you bring, and really appreciate the work that that. Um, you all are doing. Um, I know that there's more questions out there. Uh, and so don't hesitate to send Hope any questions that you have, and we'll compile those questions and get answers to them and then present them to the whole consortium so everyone has those answers. Um, and then I think I will set aside a little bit of time next meeting um, to let people ask questions from the previous meeting once they get a chance to absorb the presentations a little further. Um, I think we'll get those presentations in consortium members' hands so that they can look at them um, between now and the next meeting. And then if questions come up, those are the two options, I think, for getting those questions answered. Um, and so really appreciate that information and also appreciate the work that everyone's doing um, to kind of move these conversations forward. And uh, all three of the presenters today are doing amazing work. And so um, thank you for that. We are at the end of our meeting. I did want to just give one update. Um, we will be able to hold in-person meetings for, uh, and I think, Hope, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's for the May and the June meeting. We'll provide additional information on that. We do, um, uh, we are excited to be able to do in-person meetings. We're certainly contemplating right now a longer meeting if we're going to do an in-person meeting. Um, and so... Um, and also contemplating, you know, opportunities there may be for field trip or site visit associated with the meeting, either on the day of the meeting or perhaps even the day before the meeting, if we've got folks coming in from out of town. So we're going to work through those details over the next few weeks and let folks know. But I did want to just kind of give people a heads up that on their calendars, um, they may want to plug those in as potential in-person, well, in-person meetings for sure. 
locations to be determined and details to be worked out. But um, thanks again, everyone. Really sorry about the technical difficulties and uh, apologies to James and Chloe, Alan, Clay. That was um, that ate into your presentation time and I apologize for that. Um, but, um, um, but when we have in-person meetings, we won't have that problem. So that'll, that'll be easier. Um, so thanks for everyone's time today. Thanks for the work that everyone's doing and uh, reach out to Hope or myself if you have any questions, concerns, or comments. Uh, otherwise, have a great weekend and we'll see everyone in April.